Hello everyone, welcome to the council meeting. I declare the meeting open at 6.01pm and we start by acknowledging that we meet tonight on the lands of the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation and pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, just noting tonight that we do have an apology from Councillor Dan Loden who is unable to be here this evening um, and normally I would make announcements um, by the presiding member which is item 7 following public question time, but I think it's important for me to make um, some of those comments first. Um, and they really relate to the situation that we're facing currently with coronavirus. As you will note, we have to put in place social distancing measures in the chamber this evening. Um, we would recommend that if you um, would like to watch the council proceedings, you may wish to actually leave and watch that online. We do live stream. There's no requirement to stay here to see the debate and decision making. Um, so that, that does remain open to you if you search on our website, City of Vincent live stream. Um, and also just to note that um, we do ask that when you come forward, we will um, just be asking that you um, yeah, speak for three minutes, etc. Um, so look, the city is focusing on implementing measures to respond to the coronavirus and our priority is the safety and well-being of our community right now. We are taking action in line with the State Department of Health um, requirements as well as the Federal Government and we're also planning for the continuation of our core services as we look forward. We, will, we are engaging in uh, business continuity planning and we are looking at our risk policy which is also on the agenda this evening. We have cancelled already large-scale events in accordance with Federal Government advice and that included St Patrick's Day Parade in Leaderville. We have cancelled Anzac Day and we are also working with our community over more medium and small-scale events, many of which have been voluntary, voluntarily cancelled already. Um, we are offering to refund customer bonds where they're booking city-owned facilities and we are um, stepping up social distancing measures, cleaning and advice to all of the patrons using Beattie Park Leisure Centre, the Library and the Community Centre. And this is a very rapidly emerging situation, changing almost on the hour. And as soon as we receive advice from state or federal uh, government, we will act immediately and we will be prepared and are preparing for what is coming um, in, the, in the very near future. Um, we are looking at things like home delivery of books. Um, we're continuing to offer that. We're continuing to offer Meals on Wheels. They will be unaffected by these services, which are incredibly important to the seniors in our community. And we have also started sending city employees um, to home to work from home, both as a precautionary measure, but also to trial some of our um, very immediately um, put in place new uh, IT measures to allow for business continuity, continuation of services, but for staff who can perform those duties at home. And we are encouraging people to contact the city via phone and email. And we also um, understand it's incredibly important for us to keep up our communications with our community through social media in the first instance and the other channels that we use. So um, thank you for bearing with us tonight in these uh, difficult times. Um, if we continue to move forward and need to reduce numbers. We are um, looking at all the ways that we can include our community in our council meetings so that our democracy continues to the best that it can. Uh, we, are, we are obviously already live streaming. Um, before us tonight on the city's agenda, we are looking at increasing that to have live streaming of public question time and we'll continue to look at our IT systems to see how we can actually allow engagement of our residents and community members online. So watch this space for further developments in that regard. So that's really my only announcement tonight. It's the issue that everybody is thinking about and it is, as we are seeing, quite life-changing for everybody and we are just sending the message to stay calm, follow the advice, be kind to one another and look out for your neighbours. So I will now go to the CEO for applications of leave of absence. Oh, sorry. No, we're going straight to public question time now. So, um, members of the public gallery... ...answers from questions received by Mr Meyer at last um, month's council meeting. So I'll now move to applications for leave of absence. 
Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, we've received a, a request, a leave for absence from Councillor Dan Loden from today uh, until 8 April. Councillors, could I have a mover and seconder for this request? Move Councillor Topplebird, seconded Councillor Fatakis. All those in favour? I declare that carried. Uh, moving to confirmation of minutes. So this is the minutes for the ordinary meeting of council of the 11th of February 2020. Could I please have a mover and seconder for adoption of the minutes? Move Councillor Fatakis, seconded Councillor Hallett. All those in favour? I declare the minutes carried. Um, we have dealt with announcements by the presiding member, so I'll now go to the CEO for item 8, declarations of interest. Uh, thank you. Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, I've received um, impartiality declarations from all members of council in relation to item 12.5, which is the lease of 245 Vincent Street, leadable to the town team movement. Um, I'm just going to summarise the nature of the, those impartiality requests, which relate to uh, former councillor Jimmy Murphy, uh, is an employee of the town team movement and is known to all members of council. I've received a uh, impartiality, impartiality interest from Councillor Toppelberg in relation to uh, item 9.1, uh, 15 Leak Street, three dwellings. Councillor Toppelberg is a former resident of Leak Street and knows a number of people on the street, including one of the landowners of 15 Leak Street. Councillor Toppelberg has been contacted by the applicant and a number of residents of Leak Street in relation to the proposed development. Councillor Toppelberg has not lived on Leak Street since 2014 and has no social or professional relationship with any resident of the street. The next declaration of interest is from Councillor Toppelberg in relation to item 5.5, the amendment number 5, local planning scheme, outcomes of advertising. The extent of this interest is that Councillor Topperberg's primary residence is within the proposed amendment area and is not seeking approval to participate in the debate or remain in the chamber. The last declaration of interest is from Councillor Topperberg in relation to item 6.3, Waste Strategy Project 8, Commercial Waste Collection Options Appraisal. The extent of Councillor Topperberg's interest is that the business is within the City of Vincent and currently utilises the City's commercial waste service. Councillor Topperberg is seeking approval to participate in the debate but not vote, which would require a vote from Council. So we, we, okay, so this is in relation to item 10.3, Waste Strategy Project. Yes. Eight, um, commercial waste collections options appraisal. Um, the there is a declaration of financial interest uh, where the council member Toppelberg is seeking to participate in debate but not vote. There had been a question raised about whether this was an interest in common. CEO, did you have any comment in relation to that? Uh, yes, we did provide that information to Councillor Toppelberg and we, we do think it would um, qualify as a interest in common, um, but this is the declaration I've received from Councillor Toppelberg. So it appears Councillor Toppelberg's erring on the side of caution here. Um, councillors, is there support? I'll put this to the vote. Or oh, you have a question? Just whether we need to move and second and oh, then yes, vote on the yes, yeah, so, so I'm happy, happy to move, to move. Mm -hmm. um, Seconded by Councillor Fatakis. Are there any questions of the CEO on this item? So we are voting. Um, this is a vote to see whether you are actually in favour of allowing Councillor Toppelberg to participate in debate but not the vote. All those in favour? I declare that carried unanimously. Thank you. Um, any further declarations of interest, CEO? No. Um, I just also must apologise to uh, Mr uh, Lou uh, DeFora because I forgot that you actually had put in a request to do a deputation. Um, I'm sorry, I think we've got our minds on <laughs> big issues at the moment. So um, I'd like to invite you forward to give your um, deputation of no more than five minutes. Thank you. Okay, good evening, Mayor, Councillors and Council Officers. My name is Lou DeFlorio and I am the manager of Ad Brands Media, the applicant for the proposed rooftop garden terrace and digital screen for number 12 Newcastle Street, item number 9.2. 
We have considered the questions and comments made by the Mayor, Councillors and Manager of Development and Design from last Tuesday night's briefing meeting and we would like to, with all due respect, put things in the correct perspective so that there is no misunderstandings or misinformation that may create confusion. I have been in the advertising industry for over 25 years and have had a few dealings with Main Roads WA, as have other companies in this industry. Main Roads WA are not always consistent as rightly brought up by Councillor Fatakis last week. From the example she gave of a digital screen visible from the Mitchell Freeway, loca located between Mayon Street and St George's Terrace, which has a complex six lane road system which requires the changing of lanes depending on which exit drivers want to get to. And we know for a fact that Main Roads WA approved this digital screen for this location, which has a far more complex six lane of traffic compared to only three lanes going in the exact same direction, with absolutely no need whatsoever to change lanes at all for this end of the Graham Farmer Freeway. The manager of development and design was correct in saying that Main Roads WA has certain criteria and formulas in working out what, con what constitutes a device restricted area. Main Roads WA used the professional services of Donald Veal Consultants, or DVC, to conduct thorough safety assessment reviews for themselves. Adbrands Media also commissioned DVC to carry out a safety assessment review report for this section of the Graham Farmer Freeway. As per the criteria... Uh, go around to council members and see whether there are any items that you wish to pull out for debate and not move on block. Um, further to the items that have already been raised by members of the public gallery where there is a financial um, interest or um, proximity interest. Or were they both financial interests? Proximity and financial interests or where an absolute majority decision is required. So I'll start with Councillor Hallett. 12.10 uh, and 12.6. Thank you. Councillor Fatakis. Oh, sorry, Councillor Castle. No? Councillor Wallace. Councillor Fatakis. Um, I think I'm right. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Toppleberg. At 10.1, please. Councillor Smith. Councillor Gondoshevsky. I think I had 12.4. 12.8 and 11.5. Thank you. I'll just confer with the CEO and see if we have any items left to move on block. Sorry, Michael, I did have a question about 12.14 as well. 12.14, uh, yes. 12.14. Sorry, Mayor Cole, 12.7 as well. Just had one question about that one too. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I will now read out the agenda item numbers which are being proposed to be moved on block, which include items number 9.4, item 9.6, item 11.1, item 11.3, item 11.4, item 11.6, item 12.1, item 12.5, Uh, item 12.5, item 
item 12.11, item 12.12, item 12.13, item 12.15. Um, could I please call on a mover and seconder for the on block items? Move Councillor Toppelberg, seconded Councillor Castle. All those in favour? I declare the on block items carried. Sorry, I don't usually use my timer, and now it's going to tell me that I need to turn it off all night. Okay. All right, so. Um, for the uh, members of the public gallery, we do um, first go to the items that were raised by you this evening and in the order raised by you. So the first item raised this evening was item 12.2, minutes and motions from the annual general meeting of electors held on the 28th of January 2020. Could I call for a mover and seconder, please? Moved Councillor Hallett, seconded Councillor Fatakis. Um. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I support the officer recommendations, um, but I did want to, I guess, we noted a few thing, que questions last week about the Colvin Street um, response, and I guess I'm still a little bit um, curious as to whether administration can explore some other options, um, but I'm happy to let that stand for now. Um, I did want to note that there's a proposed amendment on the table um, from the Mayor. Um, that I'd be happy to support um, and move if the seconder um, is willing to do so. Um, you are seconder? Okay. Thank you. Do you wish to speak to it, Councillor Hallett? I guess this was canvassed last week as well. It just relates to um, noting that Council will consider the development of an underground power policy as part of the next corporate business plan review, subject to administration's advice on resourcing requirements. Um, there was some discussion last week um, in response to uh, Mr Myers' um, questions um, around this in the motion, um, and I th think it's important to clarify that um, the request was not for um, specifically a plan to then be implemented, but for some exploration of what that, um, what kind of a model might actually work. Um, and I guess it would be good to get some feedback from administration as to what resources would be required um, just for the establishment of, of um, an approach. Councillor Fatakis. I'm happy just to speak to the um, to the amendment. Um, I'm glad that we've actually uh, start to move forward with an exploration of this, and it's not just the Subiaco model that I think um, has merit to explore. I know that there's a number of other councils that we've um, had informal discussions with that um, have had some success um, in this area, but it's uh, it's one that I'm happy that will get rev uh, uh, reviewed as part of the next CBP uh, review, especially given uh, the, the costs and uh, the uh, appreciation of the city's finances at the moment. Councillors, Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I think that we should cop a fair criticism that we've underperformed on our commitments in relation to underground power. Uh, the executive director of community and business dipped her toe in the quagmire of uh, reports and conversations that we've had in relation to it over the last five years, and it's been going on for a lot longer than that. Promises to uh, form a plan, go to consultation, come up with a financial model. Uh, it's lasted probably three mayors and five councils without any real progress. Uh, the wording that's in the proposed amendment is fairly light on, considering the development of a policy. Uh, so I'm comfortable to support it, but just wanted to state publicly that I think it's time that we, at the very least, have, a, have the real conversation with the community and get some clear direction, because I think that the, the goalpost and the expectation when this first came up in 2013 about potentially accessing significant funds through the state underground power program uh, is a pipe dream. And I think that it's clear that if we are to do it, we'll be going it alone to a large extent. Um, maybe some other funding options and some other pr programs that arise. But I think that we have a, a, both the clear mandate and obligation from the community uh, and with the community to be able to come up with something meaningful. Um, and whilst the administration's comment talk about it being the 2021 to the 20, well, up until 2024, um, I think that we need to have something uh, real and significant going out to the community in the next 12 months. Councillors, um, yes, 
Thank you, Councillor Smith. I'm very happy to support this um, proposed amendment. In my short time as councillor, this is a topic of discussion that I receive, that I have received um, numerous um, queries about from our residents. So, um, yeah, just very happy to see that we're actually um, looking at doing some some um, work around it. So, just happy to support. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Uh, councillors, um, look, I will speak to it. We have definitely had stop starts along the way in investiga investigating underground power. Um, for a long time, there was um, concerted efforts by former Mayor John Kerry. Um, at one point, the CEO, former CEO, did recommend that we hold until we actually went through our Imagine Vincent consultation exercise, which was the most significant consultation exercise undertaken by the City of Vincent, and we were very interested to see whether underground power came up as a significant issue during that consultation. Interestingly, the results showed that people talked about canopy and they talked about the impact of power lines on canopy, um, but the issue of underground power was not one of the uh, issues of the of the forefront. We have actually itemised and counted mentions of, of um, issues through that process and, and um, would be able to provide that information. Um, I think it is an issue that does ebb and flow and I think that we do need to have the conversation with the community about the sorts of costs that we are looking at, the fact that the um, situation has changed drastically since Subiaco um, undertook this program. I think they really undertook it in the golden time where costs were lower, contributions from the SUP um, state um, underground power program were higher. Um, they're now um, competitive and each council can sort of outbid each other to get to the sort of lowest amount possible from uh, Western Power to do their works. But it is something that I certainly would say that people do raise and have been raising. It's often prompted around tree pruning time where um, you know, trees, trees are pruned to Western Power specifications and causes a great lot of concern in the community and it's certainly something that I've been asked about more recently by residents. So um, it has been something that has been given thought. I think Imagine Vincent was seen to be um, a bit of a guide in terms of uh, community sentiment at that time. Um, the major issue facing Council is the considerable capital costs of undergrounding power. To give an example, when we looked at undergrounding power just in uh, North Perth Common, um, that is, that is um, high and low voltage cabling, so it is greater than your average power line running down a residential street, but the cost just to underground that very small section within the common, uh, we were quoted $400,000 by Western Power. So we're looking at significant costs. The other issue that Council went through after I did make that statement, I'm assuming in uh, some election material back in 2013, not only Imagine Vincent, but we actually went through the Moyer Street project, which was the last time we secured SUP funding for our community, undertook two rounds of consultation with the community where with the funding residents were still being asked to pay $8,000 per household on a non-fixed contract because Western Power also won't guarantee pricing and the residents decided that they, the majority decided that they were unwilling to pay that amount per household. So I do think we need to have a conversation with the community. We need to have a policy position which we talk to the community about and to actually outline the costs. We need to understand the impacts of power future. We need to talk about the fact that the days of the Subiaco model are no longer here, um, that we do need to consider whether if we're investing over 20 to 30 years what the future of power looks like and whether that is sound investment. And we actually just have to talk about whether we can afford it because even with the user pay models where we're asking uh, our our, our residents to directly pay per household, we would be looking to do that, I'm assuming, if we were looking at a model where we were asking residents to pay that over a period of time, whether it be two, four, six, ten years, the city would then need to take out significant loans. And as we all know through discussion over our long-term financial plan, we do have limited borrowing capacity and we do have pressures. And we're also in entering a very unknown phase at the moment where we're having to reprioritise our current projects and looking at major impacts on revenue um, from the coronavirus. So I do think that we need to have a policy position, we need to understand the costs, we need to outline whether it is affordable, what power options there are in the future, whether we can uh, lobby Western Power to be part of their latest pilot program where they have been providing 
uh, lower cost for undergrounding power where poles do need to be replaced. And unfortunately, we have recently had a number of poles uh, replaced across Vincent, but that if it was available to Vincent, even in an area, would make it more affordable. And every time these opportunities come up, I do ask our engineer who regularly liaises with Western Power to ask the question and to put put in their, you know, in their court that Vincent is very interested in taking um, any opportunity that arises. The other option that we have talked about is bundled cabling so that tree canopy can grow around power lines. So it's not that we haven't done anything. I think that we've actually gone through processes individually with a smaller community in Moyer Street. We've gone through Imagine Vincent. We haven't had a huge response on that. But I do think that we are now hearing more about this and that it is a time to actually really outline to the community the challenges, the opportunities, the costs, and to have that that frank discussion because we I think, do think otherwise we will continue to go around in circles. So that's that's why I've put up that we develop a underground power policy and have that discussion with the community. Are there any further comments? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? Thank you. We're back to the substantive. Are there any comments on the substantive? Councillor Gonchewski. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just in relation to um, Colvin Lane, I just wanted to get some clarification in, in relation to the responses I received in the briefing notes um, regarding um, the deployment of classifiers um, within the lane environment. Um, I note that um, the lane has um, an advisory speed of eight kilometres an hour um, that related for drivers um, using the or going over the speed humps. Just wondering if the Executive Director of um, Infrastructure and Environment um, is able to confirm um, what the speed limit in Colvin Lane actually is or if there is one, as, aside from the advisory limit. Um. <coughs> Through you, Michael, I'm afraid I can't confirm that speed limit. I know eight kilometres per hour is um, advisory, but I, um, without checking, I couldn't uh, inform you of that. Are you aware if there is, this might sound silly, but is there a speed limit in Colvin Lane or in rights of way or lanes, etc.? Like I presume there is a, a speed limit that drivers must adhere to? Through you, Michael, I need to um, double check, but I believe it is 50, the default speed limit. Um, and what's the process that... Uh, Vincent would usually go to where we put residents that are talking about um, increasing speed limits um, that are in their streets. Um, uh, I believe it would be that um, we would look at previous speed data and at some point um, put that straight on the list for, um, I guess, assessment of existing road speeds for the users um, and then do comparison over time to see if there has been a change um, and whether um, any additional um, intervention is warranted. Would that be a fair assessment of the current process that the city usually utilises in these circumstances? Uh, yes, through you, Michael. That's correct. We would um, measure the volume uh, of traffic and the speed that um, traffic was travelling and then decide whether intervention was necessary based on those results. I guess I'm just, um, and, and from your response, I believe I understand that we don't, we aren't currently aware of what the um, speed limit, that the average speed of vehicles utilising Colvin Lane is. Um, it may be higher than the advisory speed limit of eight kilometres an hour, but it would be probably lower than the 50 kilometres an hour given the um, uh, narrowness of the lane, the existing interventions and the um, uh, uh, the length of the lane. Would that be correct? Uh, through you, Michael, I would agree with that. It's, it's unlikely to be below eight. It's a very difficult speed to maintain and uh, based on the environment it's almost definitely below 50. Um, look, <sighs> I know we've got a lot to get through tonight, but can I... Um, I'm, I'm not just kicking this to the curb, but can I put forward a, an amendment um, to include an item four that says um, uh, council requests... 
or the council requests administration assess current speed and traffic volumes in Colvin Lane prior to determining if any additional um, treatments are required. Um, yeah, that'll do. Is there a seconder for the amendment? Seconded, Councillor Hallett. I'm going to talk a lot about process tonight, so I'll just say I think we seem to have a process. It doesn't appear to have been followed here. I make no commitment for additional intervention, but I've been on site, and I can accept that they're based on the design, the um, development further down the lane, um, etc. that there may be a case for some um, intervention um, of some nature, um, and but that I tend to make those decisions on the basis of evidence, and we don't appear to have any. Councillor Hallett. Councillors, okay, I'll put the amendment. All those in favour? I declare the amendment carried. We're back to the substantive. Is there any further discussion? Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Just want to make two comments but won't make any amendments. Uh, in relation to uh, motion number three, um, I don't support the um, publication of everything, but I do think that sometimes, uh, and we see it quite frequently, that what is summarised by officers doesn't necessarily provide the information as it was intended, uh, and that uh, uh, can be for a variety of reasons. It can be interpretation or otherwise, but uh, in my experience where I've uh, had issues or I can see that something is an issue of conjecture, I've, I've made requests for uh, to receive the submissions and that hasn't been an issue, so um, I don't know that necessarily making it public is the answer, but I do accept the, um, the mover of the motion's uh, concerns and just note that that is something that I think we need to work on, um, but I don't think that as the motion presented is the right answer. Um, and similarly with motion four, which um, relates to council workshops, I do think that the, the loss of the council forum and that, that openness in uh, more of a discussion forum uh, means that pretty much only the decision making or a question environment is the only thing is of the council decision process. Um, it's not the decision making but the decision process that is open to community. I don't think the way that workshops currently work, work uh, I think the incidence of matters, whether it be a sentence or a complete item that would potentially need to be discussed behind closed doors would make it impractical to make it open to the public. That said, I could probably count on one hand, maybe two, or the, the number of items or things that have been discussed that uh, I personally would have had an issue with somebody be, uh, or with people uh, being present for. But I do think that we, uh, I do accept that council has uh, has a number of processes uh, within our uh, decision making or uh, information sharing in, in environment that are uh, are not um, as open as they otherwise could be. And I think that we should. Uh, work to address that, and I'm happy to commit to doing that over um, the foreseeable future, but I don't think the answer is to open the workshop environment as it currently sits, because I do think that it's impractical with a lot of what is discussed, and as I've mentioned at the AGM, uh, it is not uh, being open and transparent does not account to every thought process needing to be documented uh, and available for, uh, for public consumption. Likewise, any decision uh, um, and any uh, rationale is clearly available to any member of the community if they wish to seek that for an individual elected member or otherwise. Um, I've frequently had people contact me and ask how I reached a decision uh, if uh, if I'd happened to vote and not mentioned why and happy to provide that information and uh, I, I don't see that um, that information is necessarily excluded and I, I don't think that opening workshops in that way would uh, necessarily provide uh, that access but I, I do note that we we should seriously consider ways in which we can um, better provide better access to some of the um, informative aspects of the decision making process. Councillors, um, I will speak to this as well. I did make some comments at the AGM around um, opening workshops uh, to the general public and I think at that stage the comment from um, the mover of the motion was that things come to council and are a fait accompli. I think that is incorrect. I was just counting here that we have um, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, we have six alternative motions and three amendments on the table tonight. Um, we, we live stream and archive not just our council meeting, which is the decision making meeting, but also our briefing, which is the question and answers. Um, we are looking to increase the way in which we um, 
uh, provide public access this evening. We're looking at transmitting public question time and during um, the uh, impending uh, coronavirus crisis, we will also be looking at how we continue to interact with the community. I was at a briefing of local governments last night and we are well ahead of the game in terms of the way in which we um, broadcast and um, make accessible and transparent our decision making processes. In terms of workshops, I do um, look, I would say that these are f these are really um, discussions that Council's having with the executive team um, where we're actually talking about very early conceptual formation of policy and where we are getting briefed. Um, they are not decision making forums and when I look at other levels of government where you have uh, state and federal government making uh, decisions in Cabinet in confidence, in, in comparison our decision making process is incredibly transparent. Um, I do think the budget is an area where we could increase some transparency and I have been speaking with the CEO about whether we could actually have a report to Council midway through our budget process where we're actually able to talk about particular aspects of the, of the budget. So I do think that there is definitely grounds there within our budget workshops to look at what we can bring forward throughout the budget process. Um, but I do think that it is um, a normal function of governments of all levels to have discussions with their executive leadership team and that this is in no way acting in any secret way where decisions are being made. Um, I'll point out last week we were here till 10 past 10 and that when you look at benchmarking across Australia, unfortunately our council meetings are rather long. So this is not the council that is ticking and flicking, this is a council that is actually having a lot of public debate and really engaged with the um, agenda, not simply accepting recommendations but really asking questions and where we feel that there are better outcomes, putting forward alternatives for discussion and amendments. Um, so I just wanted to add those comments. Any further comments on this item? Okay, I'll put the item. All those in favour? I declare the item carried. The next item raised from a member of the public gallery was item 9.1. This was raised three times. It is number 15 Leak Street, North Perth, proposed three aged or dependent persons dwellings. Can I have a mover and seconder, please? Move Councillor Gondoshevsky, seconded Councillor Fatakis. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to ask some questions in relation to the issues raised from the floor in terms of occupancy of the dwellings. Um, it appears that there is uh, public concern in relation to the um, uh, potential occupancy of up to 18 people that may be allayed if there was conditions relating to restricting occupancy and just wanted to get some thoughts and advice in, on that regard. Through you, Mayor Cole. The term dwelling, which is what um, applies in this scenario, it's aged or dependent person's dwelling, it's specifically defined in the R codes uh, and in the term dwelling it refers to um, no more than six persons who do not comprise a single family. So on that basis, within each of those aged or dependent person's dwellings, there are three of them proposed, uh, it could result in up to six uh, persons who are, uh, do not comprise a single family in each of those. So ultimately it could result in a scenario where you have up to 18 persons living uh, within all three of these um, particular bu buildings. Now aside from that there's a broader issue there because ultimately that applies for all aged or dependent persons dwellings. It's not a, um, it's not a concession just for this particular development site in that they can uh, uh, have greater number of occupants ultimately. It's applicable to all aged or dependent persons dwellings or all dwellings in general. So that might be a broader policy issue at play if there is a concern that um, that number of people can live in one dwelling. And just in relation to um, other concerns that were raised during the week in, in terms of the usage, we've, um, the, um, just to confirm that um, as the usage is as an aged and dependent person's dwelling, that um, should the, um, uh, the owner wish to utilise the uh, residence as a um, short-term accommodation, even if it was short-term accommodation for aged and dependent persons, um, that the current usage would not permit that. 
through you, Mayor Cole, that is correct. Um, the reference to short-term accommodation, ultimately that is an unlisted use under the city's planning scheme and uh, a development application would be required for that. But irrespective of that, it's a particular land use with particular concessions and on that basis it's secured through conditions recommended by administration, including um, Section 70A notification um, to restrict its occupancy. Thank you very much for those um, answers. Um, look, this one's a bit of a challenge. I think I, I um, have heard the community's view in relation to um, concerns in, about occupancy and uh, plot ratio, um, and also, I guess, amenity and the design of um, the uh, rear units. Um, I think that I've also heard administration's um, position in terms of um, putting forward the application for support. I'm a bit of a stickler in relation to visitor parking and I think that the condition in terms of um, uh, uh, resident and, and parking permits is absolutely applicable here. Um, and so I think that that's pleasing. But um, I think ultimately, I think that this is an approvable application. Um, and as such, I support the officer recommendation. Councillor Fatakis. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, like uh, uh, Councillor Gondoshevsky looked hard at, uh, hard at this application, but... Um, I'm going to go with the opposite. I just can't um, can't bring myself to to support this um, and uh, and go with the officer's uh, recommendation. Um, the plot ratio, I think, um, the ex exceeding of the plot ratio for me has a number of domino effects on the amenity with the development, and it's not just the um, the shortage of visitor parking and the impact, the flow on impact. We already know from other reports coming through from staff, and I know it's a little bit of a distance away from the North Perth Town Centre, but we already know that we're experiencing a shortage of parking um, in uh, in the town centre. Um, and I th think we're also too when we look at um, approving a development where we know there's specific needs of a, of a current resident in terms of not requiring um, vehicle use, um, that can always change. So I'm always looking forward in terms of how those needs and requirements can, can change, um, uh, both with lesser requirement for parking but also future residents uh, may actually require parking where current uh, or the first lot of residents may not. Um, I think that excessive size of the dwelling uh, does flow on and actually produces concerns with the number of uh, residents. Um, I think lesser bedrooms or lesser sized dwellings to meet that plot ratio of 100 um, square metres may actually alleviate that. And I think um, also too for me the lack of outdoor um, areas, um, I don't think there's any more demographic where um, outdoor space is even more important. That's for people that may have a tendency to, um, to spend a lot more time uh, at home either because of their age or uh, living with a disability, not assuming that all people with disabilities um, are full-time uh, spending time at home. But we also know from the research that um, outdoor areas and um, spending time outdoor in a private, you know, your own personal private area um, is essential for the well-being um, and uh, the, uh, I suppose, enjoyment of life, particularly with our elderly people, and that's why we stipulate um, for that within the larger scale um, developments. Um, and I'm always looking to that social isolation. Um, I think we talk a lot about that quality of living with our residents um, the psychological benefits of having a nice um, green private little outdoor area we can go and sit outside but also ageing, um, the impact of lack of vitamin D on bone health um, and musculoskeletal um, uh, development um, which is um, two of the issues. So I looked at this, I just felt that it really didn't tick all the boxes that I would want a development like this uh, to tick. So for that reason, um, should an amendment come forward, and I know that there's one on the table um, at the moment, um, I would be inclined to support that. Thank you, Councillor Vitak, because that would be an alternate motion, so we do need to deal with the um, recommendation before us first, if or... Yep. Are there any further speakers on this item? Um, look, I'll speak to it. Um, 
I have received emails and phone calls from residents of Lake Street that have um, raised various concerns with me. There have been concerns over visitor parking, um, occupancy, plot ratio and uh, impact on, on the street. Um, in relation to um, occupancy, I think we've already had the response from the manager that that is, that is dealt with through the use. Um, therefore, if we're approving the use, my understanding is that we're approving the occupancy. Yes. Um, in relation to plot ratio, some residents raised with me that they were concerned about things like balconies, storerooms, lift shafts not being counted, and I have um, just responded to say that plot ratio calculation is set by the state government's um, residential design codes and that plot ratio is floor space and it doesn't include those other elements of balconies, lift shafts, storerooms. In relation to parking, I accept the applicant's um, advice that the residents living within um, the dwellings um, who are required, that not, not the carers, but the residents who are living there under the use of um, dependent persons will not be driving, um, do not drive, and that that is not, not going to change in the future. Uh, also, just in relation to the plot ratio, I do note that the setbacks are fully compliant, and often with increased set, um, plot ratio, you do see that that starts to impede on setbacks, and I think that setbacks is actually really important, and this meets the front setback, side setback, rear setback requirements. Um, the other issue I was going to raise was around the outdoor living spaces, that as far as I'm aware, and please manager correct me if I'm wrong, that the variation comes from the outdoor living area of Unit 1 being in the street setback area. Is that correct? That's correct, Michael. Is That's the only variation? Um, look, I am supportive of the, the um, outdoor living area being in that northern aspect because that will really be sunny and a, a nice use of a northern aspect. As we know, uh, if you're lucky enough to have a northern aspect in Vincent and I uh, am with my own backyard, then you really, um, that is really, has a great impact on your outdoor living space. So I'm, I'm comfortable with that variation. Um, whilst there is an increase in plot ratio of roughly 20 square metres um, per unit. I think overall I'm satisfied that this is a, a good introduction of a um, diverse um, dwelling type within North Perth, that we don't have a lot of aged and dependent persons dwellings dotted in amongst our residential dwellings and I do think that it is important to have diversity in housing choices within the City of Vincent. So overall um, I'm happy to support the officer recommendation. Any further comment? Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I spent a very long time looking at this application for a variety of reasons. I think the, the principle of what the applicant is seeking, uh, and they've made it clear in their submission about their own circumstances and their personal circumstances, and those are circumstances that I don't have experience of, but understand that uh, those bring challenges throughout life, and that obviously if at the stage of life that you're at where you're able to potentially provide uh, ongoing accommodation for somebody who is dependent upon you and needs it, and you have the ability to be able to provide it in a meaningful way with an ongoing uh, potential for income uh, to be able to potentially outsee your own life. I think that that's, that's an extraordinary privilege, and I'm very respectful of that desire. Ultimately, uh, there's no way of, uh, of guaranteeing that for this development uh, from the time it's approved and thereon. So the, uh, the comments in relation to parking and need or otherwise need to be considered in the context, from my point of view, from, uh, of the development as it is, not the intended use, because that use, uh, uh, if we're doing what we should be doing in terms of planning, should long outlive the occupants, even if the, uh, the, the, the intended occupant uh, lives their, their, their natural life there. So for me, I also understand from discussions with our staff that uh, the applicant uh, in good faith uh, uh, approached the city early on in the process and received uh, some advice that um, was uh, perhaps at best misguided, but that there was uh, a lengthy process that was gone through to actually uh, um, to investigate a yield of four, um, four dwellings on the property. Uh, and the applicant, again, in good faith, uh, moved, uh, moved away from that uh, towards the three dwellings which, uh, which we see today. So I'm not going to go into the... Uh, the, the the consultation, some of the neighbour neighbour concerns. For me, just looking at the developments as proposed, uh, I think, uh, and I'm not going to uh, 
give my personal view about design or otherwise, the, the dwelling that is proposed at the front is in line uh, with my expectation for the intent of the agent to person dwellings uh, concessions that the R codes provide, and essentially it is that. The R codes say that if you are to provide agent dependent persons uh, dwellings, it's a as the Mayor said, is a, a necessary uh, dwelling type within and particularly in established residential areas so that people aren't excluded or, as the applicants uh, submitted earlier, are not relying on public housing or similar, and it's a, a way of integrating people into the community. For me, the key issues, uh, well, really the key issue, is the livability of Units 2 and 3. Uh, my understanding is the intention is for the applicant to, uh, to have their family member living in Unit 1, and that, to me, appears apparent uh, with the, uh, the layout and particularly the, um, the, the area that's, uh, that's provided uh, in the front of the dwelling. When I look at um, the... Uh, I can't reconcile a demonstrated need for three bedrooms uh, and the three bedrooms also lead to uh, what I see. And I, I, I've read many times the comments from the uh, design review panel and if I look at the roughly 33 to th or 34 square metres of lounge dining area that is proposed to be provided, essentially the only, uh, given the nature of the bedrooms and the way that they lie, the only place to actually socially interact outside of an individual's bedroom and the intent is for them not to be related persons as I understand it, is in that space. And to me it is uh, pokey at best, it's not overly functional. I know there's been a lot of changes but the, the access to uh, the amenity that I think is enjoyed by R40 properties in general in the area and expected uh, and is reflected in my understanding of the plot ratio requirement more broadly is what's been compromised by the concession that's been sought. Now, I've had personally a long think about whether that's resolvable uh, through a deferral or through uh, a change in design. I think that uh, my reading of the applicant's submissions uh, and emails is that the compromise that they felt happened between four dwellings and three dwellings has been a significant compromise. Uh, it's not for me to, to redesign or to, or to suggest that uh, losing a bedroom or, yeah, or even changing the number of dwellings, but on what's been presented to me, I believe that the outcomes for particularly units two and three are uh, reflected in plot ratio, and that's what's reflected in the alternative that's proposed, but uh, that the, the plot ratio calculation and how it's reflected in the design, the livability, the access for visitor parking, and it does flow on to the inability to provide the public or the, um, the private outdoor space for Unit 1 also only within the front setback, uh, represents a, a management of the site that uh, could have been done better. And so for those reasons, I uh, personally won't be, um, won't be supporting it as recommended by the officers, but uh, I'll happily listen to the rest of the debate. Thank you, Councillor Doppelberg. Are there any further comments? Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? All those against? I declare the motion carried. Uh, the next item raised by a member of the public gallery this evening was item 9.2, which is number 12 Newcastle Street, Perth, proposed third party digital billboard sign. Sorry, Mayor Cole. Um, Ms Slath did mention the bike lanes on Car Street in her submission. She was the first speaker of the evening. OK, well, after this, I'll come to bike lanes. Can I have a mover for 9.2, please? Moved Councillor Hallett, seconded Councillor Gondoshevsky. Thank you. Um, I guess there was a few difficult considerations in this. I, I think I'm really cognisant that the applicants went through a range of um, processes with admin and put in a lot of effort um, into making um, changes to make it more um, appealing and address a lot of the concerns by the DRP. Um, and obviously it's also had a, a cost to them. Um, I mean, I think the applicants, for all the information they've provided um, and the, I guess the um, passion at which they speak about the, um, the development that they'd like to get approved. Um, ultimately, though, for me, um, as the, the council, as I've, the applicant said, is the, a key decision maker um, in this, um, for me, I just go back to the policy that was set by council in 2001 and then reviewed and um, endorsed again in 10 years later um, with a really clear, to me, um, suggestion from council that 
billboards were not something that we want um, within the city. And so um, based on that consideration, um, I'm happy to support the recommendation for refusal. Councillor Gondoshevsky. Thank you, Mayor. Um, look, I don't mind digital billboards, but I don't um, want to see them everywhere. And so I can absolutely appreciate the base position being that um, we don't support billboards or um, and digital billboards would fall under that. Um, I can appreciate the process that the applicant has gone through in terms of engagement with the design review panel to refine the design. Um, I can appreciate that this development may add some activation, I guess, or, or some something to that area um, and I can appreciate a tenant wanting to be able to utilise, um, uh, not to have to drive people around to show them their work um, but rather invite them to their building. Um, so I have thought about this one um, but I think ultimately um, I note the comments of the design review panel and I think that this one really gets to me is that the size of the proposed screen is ultimately disproportionate to the existing building to which it relates. The scale of the screen is, I don't think, is necessarily something that really could be overcome without compromising the effectiveness of the digital billboard and its task of attracting the interest of drivers that are approaching the uh, Northbridge Tunnel um, and in the surrounding area. Um, and I, I, I feel that there has been a process to improve the design, but ultimately it is still um, out of place on the building. Um, and I think that um, whilst there has been some... Uh, Whilst there is, um, there's been some uh, concerns raised, or I guess an issue raised in terms of the uh, crash data being um, somewhat out of date, uh, I still think that um, the design and placement of a um, really large uh, billboard um, with changing um, content is uh, has the potential to. Um, increase the likelihood of crashes in an area that, let's face it, can be a bit of a basket case um, during busy times. Um, and I don't necessarily think that the design is able to offer, um, you know, sort of seamless integration with the building um, or a, um, a level of um, amenity to the surrounding area. I feel that it is out of place on the building and that's, I, I've really been able to overcome, I haven't been able to overcome that. So I'm supportive of the officer recommendation in this instance. Thank you, Councillor Gondoszewski. Councillors, Councillor Fatakis. Mm. Jeez, I'm going to be going against some of my colleagues tonight. Uh, lucky that the debate's always respectful. But um, for me, I looked through that process that had been taken through the DRP. Um, initially, when I looked um, looked at it, yeah, the bulk and scale of it, um, but I've spent some time um, as sort of motivated my, my questions last week and um, in the time between having a good look at the billboards, at the digital billboards, um, certainly not within our city but in surrounding areas and didn't really notice them that much anymore even when I was driving back from um, from Woodville um, on Sunday noticed um, even more billboards um, starting to be erected along um, the freeway and even driving home from the city um, going uh, down the railway parade on West Leadville an entire wraparound billboard on the um, side of a building that is just 50 metres from the lights on the corner of Loftus um, and Railway Parade so the assessment even though it's main roads assessment to make on the the safety and all of that that data I, I do believe that there are um, quite a lot of inconsistencies through that I see billboards that are being approved um, I don't mind the LED billboards um, I don't want to see them in proliferation within um, our city I like um, the aspect and the um, I suppose the intent of that policy, but I think in these instances, uh, for me, um, it does limit um, the application on a building that is very much um, uh, on the very edge on a difficult road. And then when I look um, across the road at uh, 10 storey development um, that's currently under construction for next DC within the city of Perth, um, uh, boundary, so it's really only metres away from this building. Um, ten storeys in addition to, I suppose, since this policy was last reviewed, we've got another uh, ten storey plus 
first building just been built up the road, but that building for next um, DC, if you're looking at um, the amount of illumination, you look at the artist elevation, which was submitted to the City of Perth as part of the, uh, I think to JDAP, sorry, as part of the DA, does show a huge amount of illumination, but that's not a billboard. Um, so for, for me, um, I won't be supporting um, the officer's uh, recommendation for refusal. Councillors, Councillor Toppelberg. Can I just ask a question through you to the uh, manager? Um, do we, there's, well, there's been no separate assessment of the proposed um, outdoor space. It was just, it was comment made that it was an addition to the design through the DRP process, but there's been no separate assessment of it. Um, is the rooftop rateable currently? And would it be rateable and would the city collect rates from uh, the property, if uh, how would that be either decided or calculated? Does that wait for the next GRV assessment? Does it have to get? Does it get registered uh, or otherwise? Does that rely on the building itself? But what's the actual implication uh, in the event that um, Councillor Fatakis was successful in uh, convincing her colleagues to support um, the proposal? Is that something that is rateable? Maybe I'll ask it in another way. If it was rented, does it then become rateable? So if, the, if there was a fee being paid for the access to the roof, does that then make it a rateable property? Yes, through you, Mayor Colt. It, it would be rateable once it was constructed and um, it could be occupied. That's correct. So if it was rentable, it would be rateable at that point. OK. Uh, and can we perhaps get some commentary around the... Because, um, as I said, I, unless I missed it in the report, but the comment about the outdoor... Uh, area on the rooftop was essentially that it was added in response to DRP concerns, but there's been no separate assessment of it or otherwise. But if the billboard was off and it was just a structure, so if it was just the, the physical structure, is the um, proposed outdoor space on the rooftop supported by administration? Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, the proposed outdoor space, which serves as a breakout space, if you will, for the office workers, is supported, um, together with the solar panels that are also proposed. So um, no objection from that perspective, and that's why they do not form um, part of the reasons for refusal from administration. Councillors? Councillor Castle. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole. Look, I, I'm going to agree with Councillor Hallett on this one. I and support the officer recommendation for refusal. For me, what is clear is our policy, and I'm not seeing anything in. Uh, despite um, I do appreciate the efforts that the applicant has made to um, to make this a more visually appealing um, structure, and and including what um, we've just heard is an approvable addition. Um, I'm still not seeing anything that uh, would convince me that it doesn't constitute a billboard. And I think we've made our position clear on that. And I don't believe that this is a situation where we should be departing from our agreed policy uh, simply because we may wish to go in another direction. If that was the case, then that um, I'd like to see a change in policy before we started approving things um, on an ad hoc basis. So I will be supporting the recommendation for refusal. Councillors? Councillor Smith? Thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Councillor Fatakis. I'm glad you spoke tonight because I too have been thinking long and hard about this and um, and I'm feeling that um, I would I am um, supportive of your debate um, I do like build well, I like digital screens um, I do note that we have some throughout Perth. Um, the railway parade one was the one that I have been thinking about because it's one that I have, um, I see every day. I travel to and from my son's school. I go through Grain Palmer Freeway um, and I, I'm driving, I do drive around that area. Um, I don't think look, merging is always a nightmare in Perth. I'm from Victoria, so much better merger. <laughs> um, but uh, I think that 
it's just part of uh, a city growing, um, becoming, you know, growing up. Um, so I, I don't actually have any issues with it. I can see that it's gone through a very rigorous process going through the um, is it design review panel, um, and they have nearly come to um, all items being green. Um, <clears throat> you know, the built form <clears throat> is, of course, an, imp an important feature, um, but I think they, they have really tried hard to get to a place where, um, where they can comfortably sit. So I'm actually, for the first time, going, going against the grain here and um, will be supporting um, approval. Thank you. Thank you. Councillors, any further comments? Um, look, I'll speak to it. Um, first of all, I just wanted to ask uh, the manager, is it a valid planning consideration to consider future development? I know that at the council briefing there was questions around uh, the concrete batching site being a significant residential zoning once that the um, ex-use comes in on that site. Is council permitted to consider um, the full scale of development on that site and the um, visual amenity for future? Through you, Mayor Cole, um, that would be uh, a relevant planning consideration. Ultimately, you need to uh, have regard for a number of considerations, including amenity of the area, and that is existing as well as desired um, uh, streetscape and uh, ultimate development in that broader locality. Thank you. Um, look, we, Council, previously considered a um, digital billboard very close by at... Um, uh, on Edward Street, um, number two, Edward Street, and that was not as large as this proposed billboard, but it was also a digital billboard, eight, 1.8 metres by nine metres long. Um, so I do think we need to understand that if Council does go ahead and approve this, that there are other, um, other uh, potential applications that will come forth, um, and that this has been something where there has been interest. Um, I have really um, liked and, and appreciated the signage policy that we have in the City of Vincent. I think that it may be something that you don't sort of notice now, but in the future, if the City of Vincent holds firm and doesn't uh, prove a proliferation of third-party advertising across our city, we will actually be quite unique and it will be very noticeable when you come into the City of Vincent that you don't have third-party advertising um, all around, whether it be digital or static billboards. This is something that the Council has taken a very... Um, strong approach on in, in the past and that where we have got billboard approvals, they are rolling approvals and they are on sites that we have deemed to be uh, very difficult to develop currently with car parking requirements in place. Um, I do think that uh, whether it's digital or static, I mean with digital billboards um, that is more modern and, and it might be more engaging but it is also um, a much larger structure um, as we can see in terms of the fact that this billboard um, that's being proposed is uh, uh, 8 by 8 metres high by 27 metres wide by 20 deep. So you do get depth with um, digital billboards, which is quite different to static billboards. And this is large, and I think that size is important. Um, our policy currently allows for 18 square metres, and this is 121 square metres. So... You know, it may be um, that that uh, policy um, considered static, um, but that is a considerable size variation. And I have asked this question of the applicant and has, have been informed that the size is important in terms of it being visual um, to drivers coming through the tunnel. Um, so in terms of third party advertising being proliferated around the city of Vincent, that is something that I do think is important and really unique and sets us apart in the city of Vincent. It's the reason why we have the policy in place. Um, the size for me is important. Um, the tenancy issue has also been raised and the issue of tenancy is that where you are a tenant of a building, you are able to advertise your business. So I don't think that tenancy means that you're able to advertise third-party advertising to demonstrate that you have created advertising content, you are only really able to advertise your own business 
um, not the fact that you're advertising another third party because you've developed that content. That is quite different to what's being discussed here. Um, there was another issue that I was going to raise. I think the other issue is really around um, the fact that if we were going to um, depart from this, that we should be reviewing our policy. We should be looking at size. We should be looking at areas within Vincent where we think that this would be appropriate. For example, a residential street uh, wouldn't, would, in my view, not be appropriate in this location. Perhaps you would say currently it would have no impact on residential development. Um, there is St Bartholomew's, which does catch some, um, but I think that it is important important to consider that the concrete batching sites do have a mixed use zoning of um, R160 and will be incredibly um, tall and uh, dense buildings and that there will be some amenity impact from this signage. So my view is that um, personally if the policy was to come forward for review I would still uh, like to preserve the policy but I think that we do need to, de to debate that policy and see if there are changes afoot but I think that a Vincent free of billboard third party signage in the future would be a very pleasant place to live and really set us apart um, and I also would like to add that uh, we also need to be aware that there's no controls in place for what sort of third party advertising goes on these billboards um, and that uh, when we have had issues in the past and I have approached um, the ad, ad, um, Advertising Standards Board, it's very, very difficult. Um, when we had, for example, anti-vaccine advertising happening on a pre-existing billboard that was uh, approved when uh, City of Vincent was part of City of Perth, um, there was no grounds um, to actually remove that billboard. In the end, it was Mr Yozzi of Roller Shutter fame who owned the building and determined that that would be taken down because he owned the building. So um, there are issues associated with third party advertising and um, I do think that having an, a third party advertising free zone in Vincent is something really unique and does deserve to be protected. Um, this is a very large sign. I am conscious of the fact that main roads are approving digital billboards on freeways. I don't agree with that either, but it is what it is and it's not my decision to make. Um, but I do take their advice and there are multiple factors um, considered in their advice. It's not just that it is in the, digit, um, in the um, device control area, but they've also taken into um, consideration the um, turbulence zone and the extension zone which um, we were provided further um, information around definition and that the crash threshold was taken into consideration too. So it's not just that it's a device restricted area but that there are specific considerations um, with, with, within that um, device restricted area. So I do support the um, officer's recommendation. I would like to say to the applicant, thank you for your highly professional engagement with council, um, the, the fact that you brought on a um, high quality designer to um, make some significant changes to, to the design. I really appreciate that and I think that was incredibly professional. Um, and it is just simply that I do strongly um, personally uphold the City of Vincent's signage policy. Any further comments? Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? All those against? Councillor Fatakis and Councillor Smith voting against. I declare the motion carried. Okay, so we'll go to 10.2 and apologies for Mari Smythe that I missed that she raised the um, Florence and Car Street bike network improvements. So we are now at item 10.2 dealing with the Car Street and Florence bike network improvements. Can I have a mover and seconder for this item? Move Councillor Toppelberg. Seconded Councillor Fatakis. Sorry, Gontoshevsky. Um, I'm going to be very quick. Uh, I don't support the officer recommendation. I think that the proposed movement of the, two, the proposed movement of people uh, in, uh, is not properly articulated by what is uh, ultimately how has been proposed. Uh, I wholeheartedly endorse and support the longer term uh, uh, shift from a car centric. Um, mentality and about the value that roads and the road reserve provide for all users, pedestrians, cyclists, 
uh, for uh, vehicle users, for uh, um, waste services, for, for a whole variety of uh, for people who need to park their vehicles. There's a whole variety of uh, users that uh, have traditionally had a disproportionate uh, favour in, in favour of um, uh, car movement and car parking. I think we've been leaders in local government in shifting away from that. I think that what's currently proposed uh, relies heavily on the, the co-funding to achieve uh, a um, to achieve an outcome that I don't think is uh, entirely necessary in this location, given its current usage and the current demographic. I'm comfortable. I uh, spent some time driving on Oxford Street today, went to park my car, saw an available parking spot, looked in my rear view mirror, saw a cyclist coming past, went to let them pass before I parked in the parking spot, and clearly they were acutely aware of the issue with bike lanes being on the roadside of the protect of, or the, of the their bike lanes because they actually stopped to say thank you because it seemed like a rare occurrence for them. So I'm acutely aware that the bike lanes we've spent millions on in the last few years are not uh, best practice. Uh, that said, I think that it's um, I think that in this particular location the treatments that are available to us to enhance, whether it be through repainting, remarking, uh, as a medium term option. So yeah, in my mind, five to ten years, I think that that's money better spent and so I will um, support the alternative. I think that we've got some valuable feedback from the consultation but I don't base my decision entirely on that. I think there are some specific issues, particularly since the building of the Vincent Fire Station on car, um, in that section of Car Street. and. Uh, the, uh, some of the confusion around availability of parking permits. There was some discussion last week about the availability of car parking on Stewart Street, which I think is probably our emptiest paid parking section in Vincent. We can probably do some work around there to actually encourage people to utilise those bays uh, a bit more. But uh, ultimately, I think um, some pedestrian and, uh, or as is articulated in the proposed alternative, some safe active street improvements uh, in the area and the um, repainting or remarking of the car street, for me, I would see as, as an interim measure and uh, as the density and the, the attitude of community changes to, um, particularly to motor vehicle use, uh, as time goes on, I think that we'll be able to revisit this and look at something more holistically. I also will mention that I still believe that the access to our existing network uh, as a possibility down Vincent Street on the Beatty Park Reserve side of the road and having a better solution at the Vincent and Charles intersection that integrates into Vincent Street and Bulwer Street is a, uh, a more direct uh, east-west option for both for cyclists and in terms of our... Um, we'll see what our integrated transport plan actually suggests. Um, and I know Main Roads have got some thoughts about what Charles Street could possibly be, and I did discuss today with the Deputy Mayor that they may look at something like a pedestrian and cyclist bridge at that point, uh, perhaps as, a, uh, as something that may deliver some of their preferences for those intersections and the movement of people along that, uh, that intersection, and maybe as something that we can discuss with them as a way of getting people from the east part of our, or the western part of our city to the east and back again. Thank you for those brief comments. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Gondoshevsky. Thank you, Mayor. Um, look, this, this gives me no great pleasure, but I am also not supportive of the officer recommendation in this instance. Um, I think ultimately uh, we are in, you know, some uncertain times at this at the moment, and we really need to be making sure that we are pursuing our strategic objectives and probably making sure that we rationalise and, and um, you know, need to be on solid ground in terms of process and so on. Um, I think that, um, uh, for me, probably my biggest consideration is in relation to um, the, the route proposed in terms of um, not being a... Um, uh, identified as a proposed strategic cycling route uh, for significant investment within the uh, bike network plan. I commend the city for its work in implementing that plan to date. Um, but I think that um, at this point in time, um, I'm, I think that we need to um, pair back and um, ultimately just um, be using uh, 
the safe active street funds um, to deliver some small streetscape improvements and consider the I guess I would, I would say that the like for like renewal of um, the the lanes that exist on Car Street currently. Um, I think we've had um, you know uh, an avid cyclist, a family cyclist. Um, it, it, Mr Main presenting the chamber today to talk about his concerns in relation to um, the design here um, in terms of safety and, and we've also heard from uh, other cyclists in Vincent raising a lot of questions about some of the detail of what's proposed. Um, we've heard from the community in relation to parking and I will, um, like Councillor Tobelberg, I will say that, um, and I need to be upfront in relation to that, that um, I have heard the community's views in relation to parking and I accept that parking is um, problematic in this area but um, where there is a strong case to be made for the implementation of bike lanes and where I believe that there is going to be um, a significant benefit to the community um, for of implementing protected bike lanes, I do accept that the loss of parking is... Um, is I, I think that the loss of parking is acceptable um, and can be managed through parking restrictions and assessment by the city. Um, that said, um, ultimately I... Um, uh, I'm not supportive of the recommendation before us at this time and would support the proposed alternative recommendation on the green. Councillors? Um, look, I'll just briefly say that um, I am a supporter of bike lanes, I'm a supporter of protected bike lanes and I'm a supporter of increasing our bike network across Vincent. Um, I do take on board the comments made from the community in relation to the consultation. My preference would have been that a letter made it clear what the benefits of uh, the cycling infrastructure is, how it linked within the existing bike network and um, that there would be a loss of bays and to itemise those bays clearly uh, and also to include the plans as an attachment. I think that would have been um, just really sort of enabled us to deal with process um, complaints about the way the process is run so that we could have focused on the issue at hand which is the tension between creating um, safe uh, bike lanes and active transport options where there will be car, um, car bay losses, something that we've had to confront each and every time a proposal comes forward under our bike network and I have always been prepared to make those tough decisions. Um, my guiding um, objective right now is to look at the ability to actually deliver uh, non-core projects and to save the city some money where we're about to see declining revenue and um, a very significant budget situation. So um, on the basis of that, um, I'm not um, recommending my alternate that I had prepared, um, which had suggested going and reconsulting with the Car Street residents, but I'd be more supportive of the Green. Um, I understand this would be disappointing to um, our staff, and I'd like to say Thank you to Samuel Jamieson for all of the work that he has put into this um, and also to the Director for Infrastructure and Environment. Um, but my decisions really around um, the fact that we really need to look at um, critical proje projects at the moment and uh, this is one that we can put on the back burner, um, potentially reconsider in the future or go back to our bike network plan, which I take... The point from residents, it's 2013, it does need to be reviewed. Um, my understanding is that that was going to happen after we received and endorsed the integrated transport plan and I think that we do need to look at what is the best way and the best um, connections, um, whether it's this one, whether it's Norfolk Street, whether it's some of the others that have been mentioned along the way. Um, I would like to pursue our, our bike infrastructure agenda but I think that the time is just simply not right at this moment. Are there any further comments? Okay, um, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? All those against? I declare the motion lost. Would anyone wish to put forward an alternate? Councillor Gondoszewski, which alternate are you moving? I would like to move the alternate recommendation on the green, please. Is there a seconder? Councillor Fatakis, thank you. Um, just for the record, um, because I guess uh, it's not on the screen, the proposed alternative recommendation reads that Council notes the outcome of public consultation for the proposed Florence Street bike friendly improvements and Car Street protected bike lanes, and that two, uh, declines to approve the construction of the Car Street bike network improvements at this time. 
Three, approves the construction of safe active street improvements at this time. Four, considers the renewal of existing car street cycle treatments and additional works as per the City of Vincent Bike Network Plan 2013 in forward budget planning. And five, requests administration notify the Department of Transport of Council's decision. Um, the reason for this is essentially we have existing cycling treatments on Car Street um, and that the Car Florence Street route as proposed um, was not identified as a strategic cycling route for um, key upgrades or improvements within the bike network plan. Um, however, the um, use of a safe active street grant to fund additional street tree wells and line markings on Florence Street will benefit pedestrians um, and cyclists, um, particularly those using the um, uh, the signalised crossing on Vincent Street, um, but will also act to reduce general vehicle speed, increase pedestrian safety and increase canopy cover on Florence Street. Um, and that also just notes that um, budget austerity is likely to be required as part of the response to the emerging COVID-19 pandemic and that new non-essential projects requiring the use of municipal funds should be reconsidered where appropriate. <laughs> Councillor Fatakis, do you wish to speak to it? I do, thank you, Mayor. Um, this is a difficult one. It's almost a sense of uh, betrayal when you vote against something to do with bike lanes. Um, it's one of the aspects of City of Vincent that I love is a very early and strong commitment to uh, development of bike lanes, and I think we've really led the way. Um, as a local government to do that. You can uh, even note with that bike network plan is seven years old now and it shows how early that um, that council did um, sort of put their hand up and move forward quite significantly in this area. Um, I would also, yeah, also like to thank the staff. I, um, staff are continually dedicated to creating um, a bike friendly Vincent um, and um, really sort of like rally to um, uh, to really being able to support us with uh, with our objectives in that area. So, um, so a certain degree of dis uh, disappointment maybe, but I think there's three quick key words in a couple of the, the aspects of this uh, um, alternate, and that's at this time. So it's not an end to it. This commitment is long, long term, um, and to remind the community um, and staff that um, I don't really see this as being the end of um, consideration of the bike lanes. Um, but um, also sort of take that we are in challenging times um, budget-wise and um, a lot of very recent and new considerations that Council um, really need to make, um, I suppose, the climate that we're making these decisions um, in. So I am supportive of the alternate recommendation. I thank um, Councillor Gondoshevsky for uh, putting... Um, putting this uh, forward um, and um, look forward to you know uh, reconsidering this um, in the, in the future. Councillors, any further comments on the alternate motion on the green? Um, I just had a question of the director. This in relation to clause three approves the construction of safe active street improvements at this time. Um, is that part of the? funding grant and would that part be able to proceed if the protected bike lanes don't go ahead? And second part, uh, what is the cost of implementing that section on Florence Street? Through you, Michael. Um, it's a slightly separate project because it's a different funding stream, so the safe active street funding stream is different to the protected bike lane, so it would be deemed as a connected but separate project. So. I don't know the cost, but it's low cost because it's um, uh, it's a few tree wells from memory, so it's not a huge cost to deliver that. Thank you, Director. On that basis, I'm happy to support the alternate motion on the green. Are there any further comments? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? I declare it carried unanimously. Now moving to item 12.3, which is the licence of road reserve adjacent to lot 47 Scarborough Beach Road, North Perth, Chinta Cafe. Can I have a mover and seconder, please? Move, Councillor Toppleberg, seconded, Councillor Hallett. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Just a question through you to um, 
manager of development services. The would, uh, the city received some correspondence today from a neighbour on Hardy Street who has concerns about some compliance issues, in particular relating to noise, and they appear to be awaiting some noise monitoring data and believe it may relate directly to the alfresco, use of the alfresco area. Can I just ask what the implications are of either approving, not approving or deferring consideration of this, which was their request. I understand what the implications are for the decision, but if there is a concern relating to compliance about the permanency of the alfresco area, um, is there, what, are the, what are the implications for uh, approving a permanent structure on site if it is, the, if at some point, for example, it is deemed that the, the, the noise uh, would not meet our, the requirements for an alfresco area, for example, if we've given them licence over the area for an, an approved permanent structure, uh, is there a... Uh, are we, I suppose, in any way endorsing, uh, further endorsing the use of the area because they've been given a, a discrete licence term for the area? Does that have any implications on compliance in relation to noise? The Director... As available. Yes, through Mayor Cole, I can answer that question. Um, so the first thing is the council has absolute discretion over this um, use of permanent use of um, city managed land. Um, the in relation to the noise um, investigations um, and this application for essentially for the permanent um, umbrellas and umbrella um, the securing of those umbrellas. Um, there, there wouldn't be any implications for the city's investigation if this was approved or not approved. Um, so that this decision will sit separately to that investigation. The, the uh, operator will need to comply with the noise regulations and we will continue to work to monitor and determine whether they are or are not complying, whether the structures are approved permanently or not. Um, there is an existing planning approval um, and an exemption under the, the planning policies that we have for the use of that space, so it can be used. Um, there's alfresco licensing, lo and the local law sets out those alfresco licensing requirements. Um, so again, a, a permanent approval wouldn't change that either. This is just for the structures, it's not for the use. Um, so they are two separate things. So just for clarity, the approval or refusal of this does not in any way inhibit the ability of the current cafe to be able to utilise that space with under the cover of umbrellas for uh, people to dine during their opening hours or the approved hours of the space. This is only about the permanency or otherwise the structure. Yes, through Mayor Cole, that's correct. Councillors, uh, who was the seconder? Councillor Hallett, do you wish to speak? Um, look, it might be useful for me to provide a bit of background because I did meet with three residents of Hardy Street on Friday um, and they were incredibly animated about the impacts that they feel their street has experienced from Chinta Cafe and appealed to me to um, not um, put any further changes in place until noise monitoring could occur. Um, the adjoining neighbour has until up until this point not been keen to have that noise monitoring occur from a sort of private part of um, his home but I did explain that without that evidence the city cannot act and have sought for him to talk with our, um, direct, our manager of um, regulatory services to pursue that um, but the message from the residents was please don't put in place anything further until um, we have some answers on noise. They felt that the noise impacts of the um, existing alfresco area and use does have impacts not only on the adjoining neighbour but on the other neighbours that attended um, they did also talk about other issues which will need to become compliance issues and, and you can see um, that I think has everyone got this piece of white paper with tables before them. Um, it talks about parking infringement numbers, noise complaints received and range of call outs on the email. So just to give a rundown, um, parking infringements from uh, so 1920 to date, uh, sorry, uh, 1920, 136, 18, 19, 274, 17, 18, 500, 16, 17, 367, 15, 16, 231. So this is not directly relevant to this issue, but the neighbours were, were 
um, basically saying that they would prefer that council defer this decision um, to allow for noise monitoring to occur. Um, that has not yet been set in place. Um, I personally am open to that, um, but I do understand that this is currently operating and it's not about increasing the number of patrons, it's about having permanent structures in place. But I do note that we're looking at a term of two years with a two-year option term. So um, from, from the applicant's perspective in moving forward and committing to uh, expenditure on permanent umbrellas and to the neighbours who are saying that they do wish to go forth and have noise monitoring um, put in place, um, I would... I would personally err on the caution and um, seek to allow that some time to happen. I'm also conscious now of the fact that now that we're facing what we're facing, our health officers may not be imminently available and um, patrons in the Alfresco area may dwindle, but um, we just need to d continue to deal with these issues based on what we, where we are today. So um, I just wanted to give you that context. I had asked for a resident to provide a submission and you'll see that one of the residents did send an email um, late this, this afternoon. So that's a bit of background from, um, from the meeting on Friday with the residents. Are there any further comments or questions? Councillor uh, Castle. Through you, Mackay, I have, I have a question. If, um, if we were to, to defer this or, or approve it or reject it for that matter, but there were um, a follow-up on the noise concerns and they were found to be um, exceeding the allowable limits, that wouldn't actually have any impact on the numbers of patrons that are approved for this space. Is that correct? So, so the consequences of a, a breach of their noise regulations wouldn't necessarily give us the, the opportunity to re reduce the number of patrons? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. From a, the planning approval sets out a number of patrons, so no, there'd be no control over that number in the planning approval. Um, the applicant would be responsible for complying with the noise regulations and potentially one of the ways of doing that would be to reduce the numbers in the alfresco area. Um, I doubt that would be their response. Um, they would probably look to make modifications to that space to put more permanent structures perhaps in that space to try and address the noise issues. Um, those numbers are, they are relying on those numbers for the viability of their business, so. Councillors, um, Director, if we were to consider deferral um, and noise modelling was taken, would that then give the, the applicant an opportunity to consider whether they d would need to do something that was more enclosed or used cafe blinds to um, reduce noise if there were found to be noise issues? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, I would suggest they would do that in, in either case. If this was deferred, they would still need to do it. Um, if it wasn't deferred, they would again need to do it. If, if that's what the noise monitoring found, I mean, we haven't taken noise monitoring, so I can't say there is or is not an issue at this stage. I guess my question is around the structure that we're approving and whether you could actually hang cafe blinds or do something more structural off permanent umbrellas. And I would suggest probably not that you would have to do something a different structure altogether. Yep. Okay. Um, council members. Um, as you know, uh, Council Council Gondoszewski. Sorry, just one question. So, uh, the, my understanding is that the structure itself has been approved, but what we're approving here is the licence. And should the noise monitoring require modifications to the structure, a new development application would be required that may or may not require a change to the licence. Would that be correct? Yes, that would be correct. Councillors, if there are no further comments and no deferral motion, I will put it. Okay, I'm putting the motion. All those in favour? All those against? I declare it carried with the Mayor voting against. Thank you. Um, we are moving on. Uh, next item raised was uh, 12 point, oh, sorry, 10.3, which is the Waste Strategy Project 8, 
Commercial Waste Collections Options Appraisal. Move it and seconder, please. Madam Mayor, can I just ask, uh, with your indulgence, do we have a change of order and deal with item 9.3 first, as 10.3 hasn't been moved and there's two members in the gallery, or people in the gallery, who were here for 9.3? Yes, I think that is a sensible suggestion and I'm happy to do that. So we'll go to 9.3, which is number 17, Florence Street, West Perth, proposed four multiple dwellings and alterations and additions to eight existing multiple dwellings. Can I have a mover and seconder? Moved, Councillor Tobelberg, seconded, Councillor Gondoshevsky. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Uh, like the city's officers, I've reached the conclusion that what is proposed currently at the rear fits the definition of multiple dwellings and cannot in good conscience therefore vote to approve them, even though uh, that, that's, that's where I've reached my conclusion. But I will uh, foreshadow a move to defer the motion because I do actually think that the proposed adaptive reuse of the existing building does provide uh, a, an outcome that we don't see that often. I think that whilst the neighbours have expressed a view that they would uh, potentially like to see the demolition and then the construction of group dwellings, I think that the built form outcome uh, that is proposed here with the, um, with the site location uh, and the amenity that would be, be provided at the street front of the increased landscaping is actually uh, of great benefit. So I'm, uh, I, don't, um, I don't have an issue with the principle of the overall development, but I think that there are some issues that need to be resolved uh, and not just tinkering with... Um, removing kitchens or otherwise that may magically appear later on, but actually genuinely making those uh, proposed new dwellings at the rear in line with what is approvable under our planning scheme. So I'll listen to the debate, but we'll foreshadow a uh, deferral to allow the applicant to address the issues of the proposed multiple dwellings to the rear. Councillor Gondoshevsky. Um, yes, like Councillor Toppleberg, I think ultimately at this point in time what's presented, I'm accepting the advice from administration in relation to the multiple dwellings and as such um, supporting of the officer recommendation. Um, I think ultimately um, I would support a deferral if it was um, forthcoming in terms to allow um, some of those concerns around multiple dwellings to be addressed, but um, I think they would need to be addressed um, and before we could um, have something that we could reconsider. Councillors, i just ask a question of the Director or the Manager. Um, it does appear that there has been a long, um, a long process to get to this point with many opportunities for the applicant to move away from what the City has deemed to be multiple dwellings and which I do support. Um, do you see there being any benefit in council deferring and do you think that that would result in the applicant making changes to the dwellings in question? Through you, Mayor Cole, I won't speculate what the applicant's view would be, but uh, in administration's uh, experience, the issues have been made clear uh, very early on and administration has maintained that. It is the right of the applicant to seek approval of what is before you and they are of the view that it is a grouped dwelling development. So ultimately um, it is available to the applicant to make modifications but I'm personally of the view that uh, they've sought to uh, get a determination on the plans before you. Um, so uh, unless the applicant was of a different view, I think that is what they would like you to consider. Thank you. Well, look, um, I have looked at the plans closely. I can understand that it would be very um, easy to um, fit doorways to make the, the um, ground and upper floors to distinct living spaces, and I do accept that these are multiple dwellings, um, that they are an ex-use in this area, and that they that council is not able to um, to approve. I do, um, I do uh, also. Um, Thank the applicant for the uh, for the potential upgrade of the existing units. I think that that would be a very positive thing. Um, but I, I do sort of believe that through the through the process and through the discussion and the uh, information that administration has provided, it's been clear that this issue of multi dwellings versus group dwellings has been something that administration and um, the applicant has been at odds over from the very beginning and if it provides any certainty to the applicant that council, um, those who speak, um, are making clear that we support administration's determination of multiple dwellings, 
um, and that if if there is a deferral, it's on the basis that that is the position that council has um, has reached. Then perhaps there is some uh, prospect of a different outcome through deferral. But I think that um, council members would need to make that clear to the applicant. Otherwise, I think that we would really just need to vote on what is before us. Can I just ask a question um, through you. The, given the time frame since the application was submitted, if the applicant was of a view that they uh, wish to pursue uh, the same path as a refusal, it is open to them to uh, pursue a deemed refusal and take the matter to SAT. And if, can I just get someone to say, I've got, obviously it's an unknown entity, a quantity, but uh, the cost of going to SAT has obviously particular costs, but the difference for the applicant in terms of cost, if they were to resubmit to council with something that was clearly not multiple dwellings in the view of the officers or uh, the decision maker, what would be the difference in cost uh, by doing that in response to a deferral or having to submit a new application, roughly? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, um, so the, the cost of SAT, about $600 to apply um, for a review. Um, the the deferral would allow the applicant to um, continue to work on the application without paying any further fee to the city if they chose not to go to SAT. If they chose to go to SAT, that would be the only fee they would need to pay as well. So if they came back to council through a reconsideration, there'd be no additional fee. If they sought, if the application was refused, they didn't decide to go to SAT, then they would need to pay their development application fees again afresh. I don't know what they are, but they would be probably in the thousands of dollars. Councillors, does anyone else wish to speak on this item? Councillor Castle. Uh, through you, Matt Cole. Yes, uh, following on from your comments, I um, reiterate my, or, or will state my position that I agree with the office, officer's recommendation. I accept in this case that what we're looking at for approval is multiple dwellings and that therefore we're, we're not able to approve them. Um, in the interest of making my position clear, if we do move to a deferral. Um, I, I would be supportive of that if we thought that was something that would uh, result in a better outcome that was cheaper and easier for the applicant. Um, but yeah, that's certainly my position that as it remains a multiple dwelling, it can't, cannot be approved. Thank you. Councillor Fatakis. Um, just a query through you, Mayor, on the um, on timing. Uh, should Council resolve to defer? Um, what sort of time frames are we we're looking at working within? Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, it depends on the extent of the changes to be made uh, and the resubmission of amended plans. So, the city's officers would work with the applicant. Uh, and that may involve referral of the item to DRP uh, for additional comments. But ultimately there needs to be some time provided for the applicant to make some modifications and provide that uh, revised proposal and the assessment process to occur. So I would suggest that the, at the very least you'd be looking for a period of you know, a couple of months, I would suggest at the very least. but. Um, before you would see it again, so that would be that would be my suggestion. Councillors, any further comments? I'm going to move a motion to defer the item. So defer so the council defers consideration of the proposal uh, for a period of no more than 90 days to address the concerns relating to the multiple dwellings proposed uh, as part of the development makes it clear what the reasons for concern are. Thank you. Is there a seconder for the motion? Seconded by Council, uh, Councillor Hallett. This being a procedural motion, there is no debate. So I'll put the motion. All those in favour? I declare the motion deferred. Thank you. Okay, um, we were going to item 10.3, which is Waste Strategy Project 8, Commercial Waste Opera Collections Opera Options Appraisal. Can I have a mover and seconder, please? Moved, Councillor Gondoshevsky. Thank you. Seconded. 
Councillor Smith, great work. Uh, thank you, Mayor Cole. I haven't really thought about what I'm going to say here, so I will try and be brief. Um, <laughs> ultimately, I think that um, what uh, the element I think that I have some concern about in the recommendation that is before us is the um, uh, the definitive nature of item two um, in relation to the approving the um, business case uh, for to discontinue commercial waste collection from 30 June 2021. I am absolutely accepting that um, we have a waste service and there has been an options appraisal that's been undertaken and a review of that waste service for commercial and um, that that has um, uh, determined that... Um, in the long term, offering a commercial waste service um, doesn't align with the objectives of our waste strategy. And this has um, really come into uh, focus because we are um, aiming to roll out um, FOGO and a third bin um, for our residential ratepayers in um, October 2020. Um, I am ultimately, um, you know, an, an overarching, I'm supportive of um, looking at our commercial waste collection um, to uh, uh, discontinue our commercial waste collection, but I do think we need to, you know, uh, the process of good um, policy and good regulation and all that sort of things is ultimately you need to consider the impact of your decisions and I think at this point in time um, I, I would prefer that we um, uh, had on the public record a, um, a consideration of um, in principle support for this process um, that provides administration with um, some direction on the next steps from here and that one of those is, is a lot looking at impacts to our commercial rate payers. Um, I think this is ultimately is also you know, really important as we consider um, the days, weeks, months ahead um, in terms of um, that we're all dealing with new situations um, and I think we need to always be careful and I think the City of Vincent does have a reasonable record around managing transition. So um, whilst not uh, super different, I would um, not support the current recommendation but would support the alternative recommendation on the grey. Um, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I haven't thought about um, speaking on this item at all, so your short version was, was, <laughs> was very good. Um, I am... This has been a, a topic that... Um, was discussed very lengthy last week through our, during our briefing session, and I do note and thank administration for making some amendments to the recommendation. Um, that's greatly appreciated. Thank you, and I um, I, I think that's that has been a good outcome. However, um, I am not supportive of the recommendation as it's written, um, and happy to look at the proposed alternative recommendation. Thank you. Councillors, Councillor Toppelberg. I will make a comment because I bothered to get everyone to vote to allow me to make a comment to stay in here. Um, I think that the uh, nobody knows what tomorrow or next week is going to look like, uh, let alone in a few months, and particularly for our businesses. There's a part of me that thinks that throwing this in the mix is an added burden and an added unknown and an added cost potentially. There's also a part of me that says that while I think most of our businesses will be looking at every single part of everything that they do and reassessing it uh, in the next few weeks and to put this in the mix at that time is not necessarily a bad thing so I do think that we uh, uh, we do need to be I'm not saying to make the decision on it I'm saying in terms of the communication uh, we shouldn't be waiting if we if the alternative is uh, put up and voted as uh, as recommended which is effectively delaying uh, implementation until the middle of next year I think that the communication needs to be uh, carefully managed but also should be um, focusing on a time when people will be looking critically at every part of their, their business, uh, their property and their, and their, and their structures. Um, I will actually address the comments that were made from the gallery about uh, I don't know, some bizarre analogy about something to do with 
uh, children, I think was, was the uh, what came with schools. There we go. But um, I just I completely reject that as an idea. This is uh, a response to a well thought out strategy that uh, is belongs to uh, the city and its citizens. It's something that responds to the state government and a, the global uh, shift in the way in which we address waste. And I think that. Uh, it is reflective of our capability to deliver a service in the same way that we analyse anything that we can do economically and if the um, private or another part of a government sector is able to deliver it better, our job is to best inform our residents and ratepayers of that fact and to help them to transition into that for a better outcome for all. And This is just another example of that. I don't think uh, the criticism was warranted at all. Councillors, any comments? Okay, I'm going to put the motion. All those in favour? Oh no! Well, can't you just can't you just sit there and not vote? Oh, okay. Leaving the chamber. Sorry. Okay. Um, look, I'll, well, look, I'll take the opportunity because you never know which way the vote's going to go. But we are facing pretty dire times ahead, and just to be incredibly brief, now is not the time to hit our commercial rate payers with a change to waste services, which is effectively going to be one of the core um, key services that we will be continuing during the um, pandemic that we're facing. Um, I'll put it to the vote unless there are any other comments. All those in favour of proceeding with administration's recommendation? All those against? I declare that lost um, unanimously with Councillor Toppelberg absent from the chamber. Is there an alternative Councillor Gondoszewski moving. Councillor Smith seconding. Thank you. I will just read the recommendation um, that uh, to recommend that Council 1 notes 1.1, the commercial waste collection options appraisal, which was a key action from the city's waste strategy. Uh, 1.2, that the city's current commercial waste service is no longer a viable option in the future as it does not meet the objectives of the city's waste strategy and as a result of the adoption of the a FOGO third bin in October 2020. And two, uh, that council provides in principle support for the discontinuance of commercial waste collection from 30 June 2021 on the basis that administration 2.1 presents a further developed business case to council for option five, including information about potential impacts on commercial ratepayers transitioning to alternative waste services. 2.2 provides a communication plan to council which supports implementation of option five. And 2.3, that rebate considerations from operational savings will be incorporated as part of the development of the long-term financial plan. Um, I will just say that I think that it is um, important that we get the wording right and that ultimately I do um, echo Councillor Toppelberg's comments in that um, I think that this... Uh, I am convinced by um, of the, the argument um, in relation to the alignment of our um, current commercial waste service and our objectives of our waste strategy, um, but that ultimately I think that um, uh, given current situation and also given that we uh, have not yet really considered um, what the potential impacts are on commercial ratepayers are, um, that I think I, um, I'm supportive of this uh, alternative recommendation. Councillor Smith. Thank you. Um, not, not really any more comment, just saying that I'm very supportive of this recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Councillors, Councillor Fatakis. Um, I just did want to um, just acknowledge that change in date from uh, 3rd of August, just a few months' time to, to next year, and I think that was uh, really a significant and addressed the concerns which were um, fairly universal amongst our councillors to the um, quick turnaround with uh, implementing um, those changes and obvious concerns to the commercial sector. Um, I was actually quite comfortable with that 3rd of August, but um, that was uh, a week or two ago. Um, things change, circumstances change, and I think um, I agree with uh, other councillors, this is not the time um, for um, a short-term change. I, I think more, more than ever, um, we need to really work with our uh, commercial sector and transit them to a change. Um, I do agree that uh, the commercial sector, by all reports are probably better at providing this service than what local government or local small local government are and I always remain um, open to um, ceasing a service as long as what 
uh, what replaces it is is better, um, and all indications are that, um, like I said, the private sector are able to do better in this regard. So um, supportive of the alternative recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Patakos. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Just a question through you to the director. Um, there's an absence in part two of the proposed motion of dates for requiring the business case or the communications plan. Can you give an indication if this is approved as uh, proposed as to when those would be provided to Council? Or if you'd prefer Council to provide dates as part of the recommendation? Um, through you, Michael, um, the business case is already obviously drafted and attached. We'd need to update it and the communications plan in draft is uh, also prepared as well. So um, the difficult one is the potential impact on commercial rate payers. So we probably need two or three months to be able to do that. Councillors, any further comments on the alternative motion before I put it? Okay. Are you staying while we put our hands in or in the air? <laughs> All right. Off you go. Okay, I'm going to put the alternative motion. All those in favour? I declare that carried unanimously with Councillor Toppelberg abstaining from the vote and returning now to the chamber. I think that now concludes items raised by members of the public gallery this evening. So I'll go back to items that have not yet been debated or moved on block and move through them in a sequential order. So that takes us back to item 9.5, amendment number five to local planning scheme number two, outcomes of advertising. Councillor Toppelberg is leaving the chamber on a financial interest Could I please call for a mover and seconder on this item? Moved Councillor Gondoshevsky, seconded Councillor Fatakis. Do you wish to speak to the motion? I am supportive of the recommendation. Councillor Fatakis? Did I? Um, is anyone wishing to speak or am I able to put the motion? I'm putting it. All those in favour? I declare the motion carried. Councillor Toppelberg, you may return. The next item is 10.1, response to petition requesting the relocation of parking on Turner Street, Highgate, adjacent Jack Marks Reserve. Can I have a mover and seconder? Move Councillor Tockelberg, seconded Councillor Gondoshevsky. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Just wanted to note that uh, there was a change to the report that we received, a um, slight change, but uh, that was different to what was presented to the briefing. Uh, and it included the detail that uh, Jack Marks Reserve is designated a local open space for the catchment of 400 metres from residents, not necessarily for people to drive to the reserve. Local open space is usually small parklands that service the recreation needs of the immediate residential population. That comes from our, um, uh, our public open space strategy, and I think that was a really, for me, was a really important thing that was missing in some of the conversation is why we trying to create more car parking bays or uh, more access for parking around a park that uh, specifically is supposed to service people walking from the local catchment. And I think that um, there are some other uses in, uh, within the immediate area that uh, f that, that may um, assist, but I, I think that largely the, the parking that's in that street is there to service the local residential population. And where there is parking pressure, I haven't seen any evidence of us needing to provide more bays or to... Um, shift aside, and I've made that comment before it went to consultation and haven't seen anything we received that changed that view. Councillor Gondoshevsky. Um, look, I just wanted to say on this that, you know, I think ultimately as a, as a city we need to have mechanisms by which we can, can consider good ideas from the community, and this is something that we've been having some discussions around. Um, and, you know, so I'm pleased that, you know, we received an idea for a, a change in an existing... Um, 
uh, change in the existing uh, in the status quo um, that was then able to be assessed. Um, and you know, to be honest, if the um, residents that were on Turner Street that were the most impacted by the change, and it is right that we consult them directly, um, came out and they were absolutely in favour of this. And they said, you know what, this is great. This is going to improve our safety and our visibility and all the rest of it. I would be supportive of this. But ultimately, I think we've we've looked at this, you know, um, idea that's come from the community. We've given it, um, you know absolutely um, a reasonable go. We've undertaken consultation um, and, you know, and, I, and I ultimately there's been a recommendation that's come forward from administration and I'm supportive of that. I will note that there is parking on park side on two sides of um, the reserve and um, whilst it is a popular reserve and, and ultimately does uh, because of the um, social and community nature of the park does service um, people that come from perhaps a broader catchment that would otherwise be expected of a local open space. Um, I, I do feel that, you know, uh, ultimately in this time that that is not necessarily sufficient to warrant a change to the status quo where that's not supported by adjacent residents. Um, the CEO is just raising that Ken Silly had sent an email about taking up part of the verge to put additional parking in, but I think that Councillor Toppelberg's commentary around the fact that we don't necessarily need to create more bays of visitors and that we're actually dealing with a local open space is, from my perspective, important, and I do support that um, view. Um, I, I agree that it's always uh, welcome for, for residents to put forward ideas, but when this came to council, we were very clear that we were going to consult only with residents of the street on this matter. And um, whilst we may be able to eke out additional car bays, um, I don't know that the need is, is greatly demonstrated or that we would want to be taking out um, space on um, uh, verges, because I think the footpath access to a park is incredibly important. Um, and that uh, the fact that the majority of residents wanted the parking to stay as is was really the, um, re the request and the purpose of the consultation. So I don't, I don't personally see any need to change. And given that we're about to enter quite austere budget measures, um, I don't think that this is a priority project to spend money on or um, potentially even having the capability to deliver. So. Um, that's my reasons for not supporting, but I do thank Ken for his engagement and I also would like to note that Ken is someone who does have really good ideas and I've spoken to him about ideas well beyond Turner Street and he, um, he thinks about um, the city of Vincent and he wants to make improvements and I do value his, his ideas and creativity that he brings and I think his cafe is a lovely addition to Jack Marks Park. Any further comments? Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour of um, the recommendation? I'll declare that carried unanimously. Uh, the next item is 11.2, Mid-Year Budget Review 2019-20, an absolute majority decision is required. Can I have a mover and seconder, please? Moved Councillor Hallett. Seconded Councillor Wallace, fantastic. Yeah, love it. Happy to support the officer's recommendation. Over to you, Councillor Wallace. I'm happy to support the officer's recommendation. Fantastic, any further comments? No. Yes. I think you were going to make them, but I was going to ask either you or the manager of community yes, and business just to make a important. comment in relation to the current uh, global in, situation indeed. and just to recognise that we are not ignoring it, but uh, the difference between the mid-year review and perhaps any implications of the current pandemic. Absolutely. Green was about to ask um, the director of uh, community and business to outline why it is that we're not deferring the mid-year review in light of um, further financial implications coming forward. Um, if you could please go ahead. Thank you. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, um, 
The, uh, the Local Government Act and in particular the Local Government Regulations uh, require us to complete a um, mid-year budget review. Um, the statutory requirements are that that's completed between the 1st of January and the 31st of March and there's some fairly clear timelines around that. So this mid-year budget review reflects the financial position of the city as at um, uh, the end of December and uh, what was forecast at that particular point in time. Um, subsequent to that, we uh, have obviously um, hit the um, recent challenges in our, um, in our sector um, and we are um, monitoring that effectively on a day-by-day -day basis at the moment in terms of the financial impact to the city and in particular to the city's businesses such as Beatty Park, um, which are already um, starting to um, notice the impact um, of uh, changes in consumer behaviour. Um, we'll be uh, pre representing a revised budget um, position probably in, um, in April for Council to consider the, the emerging challenges and hopefully at that time we'll have a better understanding of the impact. Thank you very much, Director. Are there any further comments on the mid-year budget review? Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? I declare it carried unanimously. Next item, 11.5, Major Public Artwork Commission Artist and Design Selection. Uh, just a reminder that there are confidential attachments to this item and if any council member wishes to discuss or ask questions or debate on the basis of those attachments, please do let me know because we will need to go behind closed doors. Can I have a mover and seconder, please? Moved Councillor Gondoshevsky, seconded Councillor Fatakis. Um, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I find myself this evening moving a number of items that I don't intend to, um, where I don't intend to support the officer's recommendation. Um, have thought long and hard about this in relation to um, process, and um, I think ultimately. Um, what we have is uh, here is we have a um, uh, uh, the issue that a um, the city of Vincent's art development action plan 2018 to 2020 that was a, a document that was developed in consultation with our arts advisory committee council uh, administration um, key stakeholders and consulted on with the community, um, identified a um, commissioning a major artwork as an entry statement or a major, major entry statement artwork um, as a key project as part of that plan. Um, and I guess that strategic direction was set through that document. Um, however, the uh, process that was undertaken in terms of the development of um, the expression of interest um, and the assessment criteria for site and also for the artworks that were submitted um, did not place any weight on um, that entry statement component. In fact, did not um, actually reference uh, the entry statement component. And indeed, it's my understanding that um, possibly one of the key locations where one would think an entry statement could go or two would be uh, at, at sites that the city has access to that are right on our boundary, i.e. World Square and potentially Banks Reserve, were not actually uh, you know, put forward in, in the sites that went out in the expression of interest. And indeed, World Square was not considered um, as part of uh, the debate on, on potential sites. Uh, so I think, you know, um, ultimately, if I was to use an analogy of another procurement process, um, it would be if we had a sustainable environment strategy that talked about, you know, wanting council to procure an electric vehicle. And that was clear and it was endorsed by council and it was something that we publicly communicated on and we said this is one of our key actions. And then through the process of developing the procurement plan and, and tender documentation, um, it went out and it just said vehicle. Um, and that the people that responded to that tender and were assessed, um, ultimately were assessed around the provision of a vehicle 
and um, that what ends up happening is that there's no other decision potentially, like you might get an electric vehicle, but in all likelihood you may not because that sort of more specific requirement was absent from uh, the considerations. And so um, I think ultimately if we were to see that in terms of a procurement of a, a vehicle, um, we would not say that that satisfied or was that procurement was in line with our strategic objectives. And I think ultimately in this case, that's been what's happened. Um, and so as a result, at this point in time, I don't support the officer recommendation to endorse the commission and progress to development of this artwork. Um, again, this doesn't bring me any happiness at all, um, but I do I do believe that we do these documents and we, we put them together and we assign resources to their development so that they can actually guide our decision making and our action and that's actually something that's really important. So, yeah. Councillor Fatakis. Thank you, Mayor. Um, likewise, it gives me uh, no um, pleasure, pleasure to vote against the, um, the officer's recommendation on this, but I think all the points that count uh, Councillor Gondoshevsky raised um, are all ones that I noted during this process of, uh, of, a, of assessment. Um, like the analogy with the car, I think that's really important because um, I use it a lot and I think it, it, it is when you're talking about um, different ways to get from A to B um, and we are talking about a structure but it's not just a structure, this structure's actually got to help inform not just the arts um, development plan but it actually relates back to our percentage of art because that's where um, the funds are coming from. It's not, I um, just want to clarify that it's not um, um, you know, council money as such, not ratepayers' money. It is money that we have done, um, collected through that process of um, of uh, cash and loo payments. So it is incumbent on us to make sure that we really um, deliver, as we always do, great bang for the buck and that's why the plan identified um, as a major entry statement and just noting that under the arts development plan that where that um, that uh, objective was actually sits it sits under the theme of innovation so also a consideration on the art piece needs to be innovation and um, entry statement and there are two, uh, two of the aspects that I think as we've gone through this process and um, we've come out the other end um, neither of those boxes for me have been ticked and they're two very crucial ones um, on this um, on this so I won't be um, uh, agreeing with the uh, the officer's recommendation to go forward and and should it actually make its way forward the, um, are, are supportive of an alternative recommendation should um, other councillors decide that that's uh, the pro uh, process moving forward councillors any further comments um, look, I would support the comments made by Councillor Gondoshevsky and Councillor Fatakis and um, I would look to the alternate um, coming coming forward and would decline from supporting the administrator's, administration's recommendation. Any further comments? Can okay, I put it? All those in favour of administration's recommendation? All those against? I declare that lost with a unanimous vote. Is there an alternate motion? Councillor Gondoshevsky moving. Yes, the, on the dull lilac. Yep. <laughs> Councillor Fataka seconding. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just to read the alternative recommendation, uh, it is that Council notes the major public artwork commission as recommended by the tender evaluation panel and as detailed in confidential attachments two, three and four of this agenda paper. Uh, notes that the Commission process did not seek to procure an entry statement artwork in accordance with the approved Arts Development Action Plan. That Council resolves not to proceed with the current major public artwork commission expression of interest. That Council commends all participating artists for their submissions and creative briefs as received in this process and requests the Chief Executive Officer provide Council with an agenda paper that reviews the major public artwork commissioning process and presents an amended procurement process and expression of interest for endorsement by Council by May 2020 for an entry statement artwork. Ultimately, I think I've set it out in my previous statement, but um, that the reason uh, is that the commission of the artwork as an entry statement was a project identified in the City of Vincent's Arts Development Action Plan. 
the expression of interest and subsequent tender and evaluation process did not relate to the procurement of an entry statement artwork. The assessment criteria for the design concept placed a weighting on the artwork being context specific and that the design selection of the tender evaluation panel um, is not considered suitable for repurposing as an entry statement because it is highly context specific. Councillor Fotakis. Nothing to add, Mayor. Councillors, any further comments? Councillor Castle. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I'm supportive of this alternative recommendation, um, as was stated in relation to the original proposal. Um, I, I believe we had some significant issues with the process in, in how we arrived at um, a recommended uh, piece of art, and I, I'm supportive of going back and reviewing that process to to really look at it more closely and make sure it aligns with what um, has been set out in the Arts Development Action Plan. I, I do have a question around um, 5.2 presenting the, that back to Council by May 2020, given that we're currently um, considering what our priority projects, whether maybe that is that date appropriate um, or, or could we, should we be looking at pushing that back? Uh, through you, Mekko would be very supportive of extending that time frame. <laughs> Do you have a suggestion for when? Uh, I'm assuming that we, we should be putting a date around this, um, and obviously with the agreement of the mover and seconder, um, what would you propose as a better date? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I'd probably just suggest uh, that the review, the review 5.1 uh, is provided to Council in time for consideration of the adoption of next year's budget and preparation of the corporate business plan. So we'd link those two uh, and then Council can decide uh, about including this in the budget, um, even though we're using cash and loo funds for it, as well as what um, priority it gets in the corporate business plan and then Council can make that assessment of relative priority. So to uh, confirm that that would be potentially be deleting 5.2 and just stick with 5.1 reviews the commissioning project um, and provides um, uh, in time for uh, council's consideration of the update to the corporate business plan and the annual budget process. Well, I would refer back to the, back to the mover as to whether uh, she's happy with that proposal um, I'm not sure I, that I think that um, someone would need to move that as an amendment wouldn't we no uh, no well do you know what ultimately yes but do you wish to have 5.2 deleted I no. think really all council was asking for was a date I yeah. actually think 5.2 is quite critical to this motion So can you just provide a date? Uh, through you, Mekko, uh, I'd suggest um, July, uh, which would be next financial year, when we... July 2020. July 2020. Okay. Um, the director's pushing for September. <laughs> uh, can we... Well, can we uh, maybe August then would be halfway in between that. I think considering what we're dealing with, September would be f fine. Um, would think you like to move an amendment? I would like to move an amendment to change the date in 5.2 to September 2020. I, I think given the uncertainty that we have right now, um, six months down the track is probably prudent because we really don't know what we're going to be dealing with for the next six months. Right, is there a seconder for the amendment? Seconded, Councillor Gondoshevsky. Do you wish to speak to the amendment? Does anyone wish to speak to the date change? Councillor Fatakis. Um, look, I'll go ahead with my colleagues, but I just want to be reminded that this is a long process and um, although it is uh, consideration as part of the budget process, it's already those funds um, sitting there. So uh, we aren't having to find those and I do appreciate we've got a theme of um, being really concerned about um, our future um, budget-wise, but um, the money less uh, some of the costs of uh, going through the initial process uh, sitting there ready. 
A very valid point. Um, are there any further comments on the amendment? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? I declare it carried. We're back to the substantive. Is there any further comment in relation to the alternate motion? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? I declare the alternate motion carried. Next up is 12.4, Advertising of Development on City-Owned and Managed Land Policy. Was it you that raised this? It was you? Yes. Thank you, Councillor Gontoszewski. You're moving. Uh, is it, yes. Is there a seconder? Councillor Toppelberg. One quick question in relation to this, that my apologies with everything that's going on, I did not have a chance to ask by email and occurred to me. Just in relation to the... Now I'm going to have to find it. Um, just in relation to the a, um, approval of, no, I'm going to have to get there, um, temporary signs advertising a local community event that has free admission, can I just please confirm that local community events are local to the Vincent community rather than um, any other measure? Um, that would be great. Uh, through you, Merco, yes, that would uh, be our working definition. That would be local community groups. Um, the exception to that would be where maybe two groups were sharing something um, just over <laughs> the city of Vincent border. Um, if it was a Cambridge or uh, Subiaco or Stirling uh, event um, that we might be co-sponsoring. Yes, but there would be a Vincent nexus to anything. So we wouldn't, for example, see markets that were in Forest Place sitting having banners at prime intersections or anything like that. That would be great. Through Mecco, that's definitely the case, yes. Is that all? Yep. Um, seconded by Councillor Toppelberg. Does anyone have any questions or debate? Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? I declare it carried. Item 12.6, reimbursing the external members of the City's Audit Committee. Can I have a mover and seconder, please? Moved Councillor Hallett, seconded Councillor Toppelberg. Um, thank you. Um, a little bit like Councillor Gonczewski, I'm <laughs> going to um, move a motion that I don't entirely support. Um, <laughs> Only in part mostly because of process. I don't have any principal um, objection to reimbursing the um, audit committee, but um, I guess in the context of the, the reasons provided in the officer's recommendation around the um, exercise of technical expertise and um, that's the reason that those particular people are on that committee, um, I'm not sure that apart from the statutory requirement of the committee that there's been a clear delineation as to the role of um, those folks as compared to um, any other advisory group or committee that we have um, working with the city. So I guess in the context of still waiting for um, the review of advisory groups, um, which may well advise that we should um, focus on um, people who have specific technical expertise, um, I would be, I'd prefer to be thinking about this in the context of all of those groups and having some clear um, principles around which ones would get reimbursed and which ones don't. Um, I also noticed in the report that there's, I guess, the reference that there are a number of councils that do um, reimburse these um, participants, but there are also a whole bunch of councils that don't, so in and of itself that's not necessarily a reason to do it. Um, the cost is negligible um, in the scope of things, so that's not the concern for me, but um, more about um, the decisions to do this committee as opposed to um, any other um, and the reasons provided. Um, there's also an alternative um, on the table which I would support. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Um, I'm agnostic on this other than to say that the uh, I think it'd probably be best revisited closer to a time where we re are re-advertising for members of the committee and discussed in the context of potentially reviewing the terms of reference. I disagree with Councillor Hallett. I think there is a difference between a committee that has a statutory role under the Local Government Act and is, there are different uh, it, it is different to an advisory group. Um, I think that the two issues are, are separate. I, I agree with the general principle of expertise but I think that uh, we should. Um, I'm happy to uh, to. Well, 
I won't support the officer's recommendation, but I'd be more inclined to defer consideration uh, and review as part of the terms of reference uh, prior to uh, re-advertising for audit committee members. Can I just ask the CEO, am I correct, that the appointment was for a period of two years, made in October of, 20, uh, 20, October of 2019, so that will next be addressed in October 2021, so I assume June-July issues when we'd be going to expressions of interest. Is that correct? Okay, thank you. Through your call, yes. Councillors, Councillor Fatakis. Um, yeah, I certainly know I'm not um, uh, satisfied to support the officer recommendation. I think the time to um, address remuneration of um, committee uh, members is at the time that we advertise. It may influence um, the people that actually apply for these uh, positions in uh, being able to consider um, serving the community but in line of meeting some of the costs of that. So it would have been for me either um, October 2019 but leading up to um, the re-advertising uh, next year is um, something that we may want to consider in the lead up to it. Councillors, um, look, I would prefer to um, vote on the item before us and actually not defer so it doesn't sit as a deferral, but that we actually uh, vote on this item and my preference is to vote against and then the alternate could actually deal with um, a time frame. Um, I'm just putting that out there, but um, my intention would be to vote against the officer recommendation um, for the reasons that um, I agree that we should revisit this when we're due to advertise for positions on the audit committee, um, that this was not um, put forward as part of our advertising process when we attracted the three community members to, um, to their roles and also that voluntary work is an important component of many professionals' um, work. Uh, often they're, they're uh, undertaking a mixture of paid and voluntary role and I think that um, participating as a volunteer on an audit committee does bring experience and um, a sense of its own rewards to community work. So I didn't feel that, given that this wasn't prompted by audit committee um, community members um, that we haven't had a attraction or attention issue to date. Um, I thought that the timing wasn't um, wasn't right, um, but I would support that we revisit that when we're due to advertise um, again. Yep. Are there any further comments? I'll put the officer recommendation. All those in favour? All those against? I declare it lost unanimously. Uh, is there a, an alternate? I'm going to move an alternate, but not the one that's on the orange. That's absolutely which fine. Which was the intent before, so the alternate will be uh, that the council uh, defers consideration of reimbursement of external audit committee members until uh, re-advertising of nominations for, for audit committee membership. Is there a seconder? Has a few hesitant hands. <laughs> I'll go with Councillor Hallett. He slowly made his hand up first. <laughs> you have a seconder. So that, so that was the intent, was to vote down the, uh, the original recommendation, uh, as I said in my comments earlier. But I, I think that uh, it is something we need to deal with. I agree with Councillor Fatak, as it may influence. I think that uh, as we mature in our... We were among first councils to have external audit committee members and did so before there was a requirement to do so. Uh, I would hazard a guess we're one of the only audit committees in WA that does not have the mayor currently sitting on the committee and that uh, I think further highlights the critical nature of what the audit committee does uh, and that it's not uh, a further function of council or otherwise but it is actually an oversight committee uh, as required under the Act and I think that as we further develop our uh, use of an interaction with the audit committee uh, as a council and as a city, these sorts of things can and should be discussed and that's the appropriate time to do it is as we head towards um, a potential change in membership or um, potential review of the terms of reference. Councillor Hallett, nothing to add? Councillors? Councillor Fatakis? Um, I've just got a question um, either through to the director, through your mayor, uh, to the director or CEO, just to get um, some time frame um, put on to this alternate recommendation. So um, if we are heading towards um, advertising 
um, and a reappointment commencing October 2021, when would council need to actually be be considering this, um, either during that budget process or um, I'd l really like to see a time frame um, of when we actually reconsider uh, consider this? Uh, through you, Michael, I don't have that exact date, but if we could just tie it to uh, council approval, um, the time when we go out for advertising, um, probably about three months before the expiry of uh, those terms, so we could um, come to council before we put out uh, that ex the request for expressions of interest in joining. Um, so we will can I, can I just come ask to council before we do that. Just for clarity. Uh, the motion, as before it says, that it defers consideration until the commencement of advertising. Is that, or the commencement of the advertising process? Was that the wording? Which implies a date. Uh, and through you, Mayor Cole, so we would come to Council to consider this item, um, the Council meeting prior to uh, the time frame for that, about three months before uh, the appointments would need to be considered. Oh, well, there's, um, yeah, so we'll just, uh, pro uh, just amend that to include um, the insertion of all we had previously on there, um, June 2021 20, um, was on there, but um, if you're um, happy with July 2021, but. Yeah. Um, isn't there an amendment forthcoming? Sorry? That was it. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Toppleberg. Do you wish to speak to it? Councillor Toppleberg. Um, what, sorry, it's gone off the page. What are we voting on here? Oh, it wasn't that the motion be deferred, it was that the consideration of reimbursement of external audit committee members be deferred until the commencement of advertising process for the next audit committee no later than July 2021. Is everyone happy with that? What was the, sorry, what was the amendment? No, to add the words no later than July 2021. Okay, all right, fine. I'll put the amendment, all those in favour? Declare it carried. We're back to the substantive. Is there any further comment? Okay, I'm putting it. All those in favour? Oh, sorry, I thought you were voting early. Go for it, Councillor Top um, Castle. Um, I actually don't support this <laughs> recommendation. I would rather deal with it now. Um, and I would also prefer to deal with this in the context of all of our external um, groups. I take the point that Councillor Top Council oh, can't speak at this hour, that Councillor Topperberg said uh, that I don't believe the audit committee is in the same category as an advisory group. However, I would prefer to look at all of our groups as a whole as opposed to picking out one and making decisions on that even if they're going to be deferred um, and then having to revisit the other groups separately. So I won't be supporting this. Uh, I don't know. Is it, is it an amendment or an rec alternative recommendation? Whatever it is, we're I'm dealing not with an alternate. It. We're dealing with an alternate motion. Yeah. Um, but we are so actually at the moment we're just dealing with an amendment, which is just about. No, we'd voted on that. Sorry, I'm getting really tired now. Um, so we are back to the substantive. I too have some mixed feelings about this because I'm not completely sure I support it, but there is an opportunity to consider this later. So on that basis, I, I'm happy to support the alternate motion. Um, I'll put it unless there's any further comments. All those in favour? All those against? Councillor Castle voting against. Um, I declare it carried. We have four more items to go in case anyone was wondering. Next item is 12.7 Lisa Four View Street, North Perth, Pride WA. This was raised by Councillor Toppleberg, who's moving. Is there a seconder? 
Is there anyone else that wants to second? Councillor Castle, just uh, so giving I, you a break over there, Councillor Gonchaszewski. <laughs> I, I did have a question. Uh, the recommendation in the report is silent on the car parking. Uh, we have had a conversation today about the poten a potential use of the car parking uh, that's been requested by uh, an, an adjacent, well, a, a government-owned business entity. Uh, what is the status of the car parking? Is it intended to be included in the lease? If it is are there alternative options available to us to be able to provide car parking in lieu elsewhere? But do we understand if it's a critical component of the, um, the request to lease the property? Happy for the question to be taken on notice, the given that it's silent um, on it. Manager is not here. Yeah, as far as I'm, given that it's silent on it, I just I'm just flagging that it's something that we do need to address because if it's silent on it. We are affected, and the lease itself needs to, I assume, to talk to it. But um, there was some discussion today about potentially an alternative. Do we need to? I know what, you, what you're referring to is the potential of having uh, Australia Post access, and I think it's a very good question. But if the lease is, um, if, I, I would assume that the lease is for the entire lot area, which would take in the car park. So it's a very good question to raise. Um, is that anything you might be able to help us with, Director of Community and Business? We're just talking about the leasing area for four. So we, we've been requested uh, to be able to potentially provide Australia Post with an area in that vicinity that's pretty much the same size as that car park, those car parking bays that are fortuitously immediately adjacent to a footpath. Would it be open to us if this was approved to be able to negotiate with Pride WA about potentially providing the effect because there's effectively two tandem bays about providing those bays uh, those two bays in lieu elsewhere within the immediate vicinity as opposed to potentially giving up four bays to accommodate Australia Post's request uh, through you uh, Mayor Cole we, um, I don't know the site uh, that well mm -hmm. so I can't comment on that and the uh, responsible officers not here to answer that so we can defer the item or if it, that was um, something that you would like to consider? I'll, I'll speak to it then, having asked the question. I don't think that what's oh, the Sorry, I can clarify that because the relevant office is watching us on live stream. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the car park at the rear is not part of the lease area, just the buildings, not the, the so adjacent the, car park is not the part of the lease The adjacent car area. parking, so there's two bays that form part of the property. The car park at the rear is not part of the lease area, it's just the lease is just for the building. Thank you, Manager of Governance. Uh, I, then, as a question to be taken on notice, I'd like to know what is the current status and who patrol, or what is the current status of those two car bays, because it seems like odd land to be uh, adjacent to a paid car park to have two tandem bays that are just free and open. But I think I'm comfortable with the recommendation either way, and I can't see something that can be clarified given that the recommendation is silent on it. I know there's, there's been an existing uh, short term lease or licence, but those terms are to be uh, concluded by just ask that we consider Australia Post's request and the potential uh, appropriateness of that location um, in line with the lease negotiations. Councillor Castle, nothing to add. Any councillors wish to comment? Look, I just will comment on the car bays and the ability to potentially help um, Australia Post out. I think that over this period um, access to post is going to be incredibly important. Um, I know this isn't on the agenda as such, but now that you've raised it, um, I'm just flagging with the Manager of Governance that there is an interest in exploring this um, option for Australia Post, and we will probably see dwindling car park use over the coming months, but the importance of postal service. So I think that it would be good to have something in that North Perth location, so just flagging that we should explore that further. Any further comments on this item? Okay, I'm putting it. All those in favour? Declare it carried unanimously. That brings us to item 12.8, amendments to the city's risk management policy and approval of risk appetite and tolerance statements. Moved by Councillor Gontoshevsky, seconded. Come on, people. Ah, oh, Councillor Wallace, we're going with you. I just wanted to say that I support the officer's recommendation here and I think this is uh, quite a timely item 
um, in terms of we are both uh, dealing with risk management and issue management as we speak. Um, I think ultimately what's clear from this policy is that where a risk classification results in a high or extreme risk, um, that uh, the treatments for that uh, risk require um, council endorsement and will be the responsibility of council and the CEO to ensure that they're implemented. Um, and I think ultimately that um, that's a really important thing um, and that looking forward, oh, looking forward, uh, that I trust that this uh, document, as with all of our very well-developed documents, will um, uh, be something that guides our decision making and our action going forward. Councillor Wallace, nothing to add. Um, anyone wish to comment? Look, I will just reiterate those comments just to say that we have this document and that we will be using it imminently um, and that um, Councillor Gonczewski and I had a look through this document today and we realised that we um, are already, if we're categorising that um, coronavirus is almost certain, and that is absolutely beyond doubt, that we are looking at um, major to extreme risk management upon mm -hmm. us, and so this document absolutely comes into play. Um, it is a it requires council to be um, to be across all of the issues that are happening and for us to be responsive. And I do think it's worth noting that special council meetings can be held um, at, any, at any time. We just need to inform our community that they're happening um, so that we can be nimble and responsive and um, that uh, any, any issues on service issues um, should really be uh, now being addressed, which they are, and our business continuity statement should work in tandem with, with um, this, uh, these uh, risk appetite and tolerance statements that we're endorsing this evening. So, um, yeah, this is uh, incredibly timely and will definitely form subject potentially of a special council meeting when looking at issues like business continuity planning. Any further comments? And okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? Declare it carried unanimously. Uh, the next item is 12.10, uh, elected members continuing professional development policy and absolutely ma absolute majority decision required. Moved by Councillor Toppelberg, seconded by Councillor Gondoszewski. Thank you, Mayor. Support the policy and happy to move the two amendments once the seconder has spoken. Councillor Gondoszewski, Councillor Toppelberg. Uh, so I'll move the amendment on the blue, which is to uh, have a subject two, and we might make this subject two one, uh, because there is another subject two coming after. But this uh, was requested from Councillor Loden. Subject two, noting that Council will consider whole of Council development, including a Council assessment of development opportunities, which may consider constructive feedback and advice from other elected members and or the Chief Executive Officer. This will promote broader professional development of objectives and inform individual or collective training for elected members. The changes are shown in the marked up version of the policy at attachment three. Is there a second of this? Councillor Hallett, do you wish to speak to it? No, I think it's in line with contemporary expectations for a similar environment and decision making group. Councillor Hallett, you're happy to support councillors? I'm happy to make some comments. Um, I think that this this has been raised with me by Councillor Loden, and I did talk to him about the fact that we could potentially um, provide uh, this idea of an exchange of feedback and advice with administration only through the Chief Executive Officer, who is the Council's employee, and that that could potentially be considered as part of the CO performance policy um, that we have, and that we, at the last CO performance review, we did encourage for that feedback to happen. Um, the other opportunity that the CEO has discussed is um, sort of board development where you look at how they do this in the corporate world, you look at how the board functions and strengths and weaknesses and development opportunities as a group of people. Um, I'm not sure about constructive feedback and advice from other elected members or the Chief Executive Officer and how that would actually work in, in principle. I think that it would, there are more um, sophisticated ways of actually doing board development and so that wording itself I think is, um, 
is interesting um, and probably would prefer to do some kind of board development um, but I do see that we could definitely do constructive feedback through the CEO performance review process but I'm not sure that that's I think that's a better vehicle than the elected member continuing professional development policy so personally I won't support the amendment for those reasons. Comments? Okay I'll put the uh, amendment all those in favour? All those against? I declare the amendment lost. We're back to the substantive. Are there any further amendments? Sorry, I had promised two. So uh, this would just be amendment to two, subject to council approval of interstate and interstate travel, as shown in the marked up version of the policy at attachment three, as requested by the mayor. Is there a seconder? Seconded council gone to I'll go to Council of Tarkas this on this yeah. Thank you, Council of Tarkas. I had a question. Uh, is there a definition for interstate travel? Well, probably anywhere outside of the metropolitan area. Um, do you wish to speak to it or do you wish me to speak to it? Look, I'm happy to speak to look at the back in 2014 council um, took the took the quite bold decision at the time to ban councillor travel and that was around um, pretty much austerity not austerity that's going too far but we had we had a well documented budget issue in 2014 and had to um, have a number of measures in place to try to bring the um, budget back into the black and one of the um, issues that was raised was council travel. Um, that lapsed with that term. The, it was a motion rather than a policy change and that came to an end naturally at the end of that term. Um, but I do think that we do, um, that that principle of approval of travel um, should, should, I'm not saying that this is a ban, but that we do need to be considerate of expenditure around travel. Um, we haven't actually spent any money on councillor travel at least in six years um, since I've been a council member. Um, and uh, I think that we do need to just um, just basically be clear that when expenditure is, is going towards travel, that council has the ability to actually review that and see whether we think that that is uh, necessary and um, prudent. Any further comments? Okay, I'll put the amendment. All those in favour? I declare it carried. We're back to the substantive. Is there any further comment? Okay, I'll put the substantive motion. All those in favour? I declare the motion carried. The next item is the last for the evening. It's 12.14, which is lease of community building at Woodville Reserve, 10 Farmer Street, North Perth, Ethnic Community Council of WA, Inc. Um, can I just ask a question about, should this say Transition Town Vincent and? No, the, the form, okay. Yes, moved Councillor Toppelberg. Sorry, who's seconding? Councillor Fataka. Okay, so you stole my thunder a little bit. Uh, part four of the recommendation notes the Transition Town Vincent's proposal is to be refused, but the calendar of proposed uh, use on page 30 uh, indicates that it will be shared. Can we just get some indication that both Ethnic Community Council and Ten Town Team Vincent have been informed of the recommendation and that Ethnic Community Council is able to take on the full burden of what is proposed? Is that that's not clear in the report, but just confirming that is what is proposed? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, yes, we've confirmed that with Ethnic Communities Council. Um, and my other question, again relating to, so it's silent on car parking. Uh, there is a comment on. Uh, in the background information, uh, or oh, sorry, on the proposal that Ethnic Community Council uh, is affiliated with the prior tenant. The prior tenant uh, used to park eight vehicles on the reserve at Woodville Reserve, uh, and as my understanding is that was a part of their agreement but not explicit in the lease. Can we just clarify that there is no provision of any car parking anywhere on the reserve to be proposed as part of the lease? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, that's not part of the lease and I'm not aware of that proposal to um, or that they were mm -hmm. seeking to have those buses back on the reserve next to the community garden. For clarity, is there is there any if we approve as recommended, 
if we see any vehicles parked on the reserve that are not directly associated with the community garden or the um, the men's shed, uh, does that would that constitute a breach of the lease terms by the uh, ECC? Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, that part of the Woodville Reserve um, and the use of that for parking, we could consider outside of if it was temporary or depending on the time uh, that they wanted to park vehicles, we could consider that and approve it on a case-by-case -case basis. That doesn't really answer, but then my, the, the question is without that case-by-case -case approval, would it be considered outside of the terms of the lease if vehicles were parked consistently that belonged to ECC? I'm particularly concerned about overnight parking. I know there's casual parking in the daytime for the uses that are on the reserve and there is a, either a license, part of the licence agreement or general acceptance of it, but the permanent use of the reserve for car parking, particularly overnight, is not included in the lease and that it would be open to the city to demand that that practice cease if that was to happen as a result of this portion of the property being leased. Uh, through you, Mekon, unless I get a message from our remote worker in the next uh, five seconds, that is the case. Um, so what happened between last Tuesday and this Tuesday to Transition Town Vincent? Okay. Um, was there any other option for Transition Town considered, such as a management... Uh, agreement? Uh, through you, Merkel, we've had that discussion with Transition uh, Town Vincent and uh, we can certainly look at other options for them for the use that they were looking uh, to hold meetings and some sort of events in other buildings. Um, could I just ask that if we could come to some agreement over a management arrangement, uh, just a repeated arrangement, um, does, it, does this... So this prohibits Transition Town, Vincent, from being able to share the facility. I just, I did like the outcome that there were two uh, groups sharing one facility and I thought that that's really the, the model, is trying to encourage shared use. Um, is, can we get a bit more information on, on why one couldn't have a partial lease or one couldn't then have some kind of management agreement in place that was perhaps... Um, more conscious of their ability to pay because we are under our framework if you're a category one I thought we were still looking at community groups where they had limited revenue streams but still looking to provide some potential for them to utilize a building particularly given that this is quite short term. Uh, through you Mayor Cole, uh, it was uh, uh, quite a nominal uh, fee under the draft property management framework but Transition Town team, um, Transition Town Vincent did decline um, when they saw what that uh, figure was so we proceeded in the report uh, to go with the principal leaseholder, it would be up to the principal leaseholder to um, come up with some arrangements for uh, temporary uses like the, uh, Transition Town Vincent were proposing. Okay, thank you. Are there any further comments or questions? Councillor Hallett. Um, have there been any um, discussions with Ethnic Community Council about um, their relationship with Transition Town Vincent and the likelihood that they would use the discretion mentioned in the report to let them use the space? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I think the previous arrangement as proposed in the, uh, the briefing note um, was mutually agreeable to both parties, so nothing would prohibit that uh, happening in the future. Um, I guess just a, a comment that um, maybe at some point we can revisit the grant opportunities available to TTV um, in the future. Councillor Toppelberg. So I, I do just have a further question. So the proposal that came from uh, the Wajuk Northside Aboriginal Community Group, part of the reason that it was not considered was because they would require exclusive use of the premises, but given the transition town, so we're now considering uh, an exclusive use effectively. Um, is there any requirement built into the lease to force ECC to uh, make the premises available for other uses in the times that they don't require the premises? Because if they effectively were now offering them an exclusive use, and I don't know whether the analysis of their proposal against WN's proposal was considered on the basis of exclusive use? 
uh, th through your MECO, uh, we could reconsider that and go back to um, the three groups that express interest and uh, come uh, try to find some other uh, potential arrangement if that was what Council was keen to see. Um, what are the implications of the current use of deferring the item for, for a month? Would that be sufficient time to resolve that issue and potentially come back? Uh, through you, Michael, it's not currently being used, so um, the, I'm not sure how urgent the demand is for that building. So just a further question then, if the, if the lease wasn't in place for any one of these three groups or any other group wanted to use that building in the interim between this meeting and the next council meeting or potential lease being drawn up, are there, is there provision within the city's property uh, um, leasing or occupancy arrangements to be able to allow those groups to use the building for that time? Through you, Michael, I don't actually know whether it's available for an hourly or a daily um, hire arrangement because we were looking for a um, exclusive longish, short to longish term lease. Councillor Gondoszewski. I was really pleased to see Transition Town Vincent potentially having a home at Woodville Reserve. I actually think that um, having multiple users in the facilities increases community benefit. Um, and just potentially the activities of Transition Town Vincent might, you know, more likely align with the long term use and recreation and gardening -y and shedy type things that are happening there. So I'm actually a bit sad about this. And um, given that um, the issues that <laughs> Councillor Toppelberg's raised, um, I think, again, in terms of process, it appears that we may have discounted someone on the basis of something we've ended up offering someone else. Um, and uh, ultimately, it would appear that um, Transition Town is really just seeking access to a site on a regular basis via a management agreement and I presume that those things can be accommodated um, within our decision making and um, although we're um, not quite at the point of uh, finalising our leasing framework but um, so I think yes I would um, happily foreshadow a deferral. I would like to move a deferral to reconsider this item. Seconded by Councillor Hallett. If there being, is this being a procedural motion, there is no debate. I'll put the deferral motion. All those in favour, I declare it carried. Um, that was the last item for Council to consider this evening. And I'd just like to say a big thank you to the community members who attended tonight for um, supporting our... Uh, our separation measures in the public gallery and um, look forward to updating our community through our um, live stream which becomes ever more important as we move forward and um, we'll um, start to look at whether we can uh, allow for public engagement um, online as well. So thank you everyone and wish you good night. Oh and I declare the meeting closed at 9.34pm. Uh,